Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Is talk today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning, my friends. Just gone six o'clock on Thursday, the 11th of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Developments overnight in Bradford as 25 year old Habiba Masum is charged with murdering a young mother who was stabbed while she pushed a baby in a pram. A trans treatment row ignites in the Labour Party after the Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting throws his support behind the cast review. And the Porky Pie Prince calls for Harry's American visa application to be made public as concerns grow about whether he lied about his drug taking past. The legend that is Kinsey Schofield will have the latest before seven. And finally, some sunshine and warm weather. Hurrah! But not everywhere. <laughs> I'll have the details in the forecast a little later. <laughs> Cheers she now. She never gives it. She's never just like consistently happy. Well, it? it's not her fault. It's the weather. Well, I just take responsibility. Excuse <laughs> me. Don't you shoot the messenger. Thank you very much. Fair thank enough. You. I say thank you, Naz. Can we get to my favourite person? Yes. It is now time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you very much. Good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masum, who's 25, is due to appear at Bradford Magistrates Court this morning. He's also charged with possession of a knife. Masum is accused of stabbing Kulsuma Akta, who was 27, in broad daylight on Saturday. She died later in hospital. The victim's family described her as polite and humble and someone who made the people around her laugh. The Metropolitan Police will reinvestigate why it charged TV presenter Caroline Flack due to possible new evidence. The TV star was facing prosecution for assaulting her boyfriend when she took her own life in 2020. A coroner ruling says she feared the publicity a trial would attract. The CPS had said Caroline should only get a caution, but the Met appealed it and she was charged. Flack's mother has repeatedly criticised how the police handled the case. The US president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said the US's commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it could to protect Israel's security. It comes as Israel's military says it's killed three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Henya. All of them worked for the Hamas military. They're among the highest profile targets to be killed in Gaza so far. Hamas says four of his grandchildren were also killed in the strike. And Donald Trump has spoken out over Arizona's new abortion ban, saying it goes too far. The former president, who was in office when the historic Roe v. Wade legislation was overturned, has joined critics of the new legislation, which means women in the state could be jailed for getting an abortion unless it's to save the mother's life. But these are mixed signals from Trump coming just days after he released a statement saying abortion rights should be left to the U.S. states. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Um, thank you so much indeed. Before we get to the main uh, news stories this morning. Can I just say, as ever on the show, we want your input. Um, the sort of couple of main things I want to get your thoughts on today. Wes Streeting last night on Never Mind the Ballots, the new uh, online show with The Sun. Fantastic. Wes says, he sort of changed his opinion, didn't he, on this whole transgender debate, really? He, he sort of appeared stopped... to. Yeah. Um, he waded into this, uh, this, this row saying that NHS treatment was scandalous and 
he has total support for the CAS report that came out yesterday, which basically said it was about puberty blockers, it was about age, it was about, you know, we should be talking in more detail with these kids before they're given this help and really pushed in any direction. J.K. Rowling, quite vocal this morning. What do you make of that? Uh, talk today at talk.tv, text 287222. Uh, Start your message with the word talk. Day two of this, but this CAS report's going nowhere, is it? It isn't. And also, we're going to be having a really interesting debate later on in the show following a council in Nottinghamshire who is pr that are Oh, sorry, proposing to use legal powers to ban catcalling in the area. Thorpe! So we're going to be asking you what your feelings are about catcalling. We'll have a debate about it later on in the show. Talk today, talk to TV, text to 87 treble to it's five past six. So we'll start this morning, as you heard, in Bradford, where a 25-year-old man has been charged over the murder of a mother who was stabbed to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. Habiba Masoom from Burnley will appear in court later after he was arrested during a four-day manhunt following the killing of 27-year-old Kulsuma actor on Saturday. We're joined by Times Radio presenter James Hansen. James, a very good morning to you. Um, good morning. As with all of these stories, which are so horrific, mm. uh, at the moment uh, it's going through police procedure charges, etc. so it's difficult. What do we know? What are the facts? Because this is another story that should shock everybody. Absolutely. So what we know so far is that Habiba Masoom has been charged with the murder of a woman stabbed to death whilst pushing her baby in a pram. Four other men arrested in Aylesbury on suspicion of assisting an offender and drug offences remain in custody. Uh, Habiba Masoom was uh, also charged with possession of a bladed article. He's going to appear at Bradford Magistrates Court today. And we know that the person who died was called Kulsuma Akta, 27. She died after being stabbed in Bradford on Saturday afternoon. It's so incredibly sad, isn't it? She was pushing her baby in the pram. I believe the baby is unharmed and has been looked after by, by family members. Yes, indeed. And she was taken to hospital as well. Kulsuma was taken to hospital at the time, but, but later sadly died from her injuries. And, and there was, of course, a, a four-day manhunt as well that, that followed this. It's very difficult, and we've had this discussion before we came in. We're sending Nick uh, Ellaby, our, our reporter, to Bradford uh, to report yeah. live from the scene in the next uh, couple of hours. And we'll do that throughout breakfast. Um, there's a lot to this story, ladies and gentlemen, that we can't talk about right now that shine a light on many things. Four accomplices, uh, a justice system, uh, just just terrible, terrible questions to be answered and uh, our thoughts with her family. I mean, just pushing your baby, for God's sake, what's happening to this world? And right? we understand that the, the victim in this case had been in contact with the police yeah. previously. Yeah. Um, so potentially wider questions to be asked about, yeah, the way in which uh, this case was handled. And but we we'll know that, that. The, the police service have referred themselves to the watchdog, which I believe is standard in a case like this. But thank you so much for bringing us the latest. Jay, stay James. there. We're going to have a quick look through the uh, this morning's front pages for you in the Telegraph. This is confusing to me. Uh, Biden warns Iran not to attack Israel as he vows ironclad support amid threats of an imminent attack from Iran. Well, the Times reports on the rise of sickness benefits, with some of the highest increases being recorded in affluent conservative areas. And a ring of steeds say the Sun's police reveal security plans ahead of this weekend's Grand National Entry. It is the biggest security operation since 1997, when the IRA threatened bomb action. Well, let's move on now to other stories this morning. And West Streeting has branded NHS treatment of kids questioning their gender as scandalous. Speaking on Never Mind the Balance with the Sun's Harry Cole, the Shadow Health Secretary was asked whether his position on trans issues had changed as his party battles with their definition of a man and a woman. This is really interesting. Quite a, a seminal moment when you think there's an election coming. This is what West Streeting had to say yesterday. They ran a campaign saying trans women are trans, trans women are women. Get over it. Do you agree with that? Mm, uh, no, it's to the extent that, that, and I say this with some self-criticism and reflection. If you'd asked me a few years ago uh, on this topic, I would have said trans men are men, trans women are women. Some people are trans. Get over it. Let's move on. This is this is all blown out of proportion. And now I sort of is sit and reflect and think actually. There are lots of complexities and challenges. Isn't that the problem, though? Leading debate. figures like yourself, and I'm not just singling you out, but leading figures like yourself were saying, get over it. No, when people I think were trying that's, to, When people were right. trying to raise the facts. So you regret... No, I think you we've got to absolutely take the criticism on the chin. 
A uh, very interesting Let's get the reaction of James, who is still with us, uh, alongside political commentator Reem uh, Ibrahim, who's down the line. Reem, good morning, James. Just back to you. Mm -hmm. um, let's put some context into this, because yeah. it's a very, very contentious issue, isn't yes. it? Yes. OK, I was reading this morning about J.K. Rowling, who's been vociferous and has been attacked for, by all sides. The CAS review yesterday, for people tuning in, basically said what? Why has it led to West Street? And give us some background. Well, it basically said that... Children have been prescribed, under 18s have been prescribed on the NHS puberty blockers, which are these drugs that uh, stop the progression of certain hormones that, that bring on the onset of puberty, um, without enough evidence, without enough scientific backup for that. And so it published a series of recommendations which have been welcomed by both the government and, interestingly, the Labour Party. And I think politically what is interesting is you can hear there from West Streeting, he was quite open about the fact he's been on a bit of a political journey on this and his position on trans issues has become more nuanced. And we've seen that also more broadly from the Labour leadership. I mean, remember a couple of years ago, quite often you'd have Labour front benches going on the media and would be asked that kind of classic gotcha question of, well, what is a woman? Mm. And they would get themselves into a bit of a pickle struggling to answer that. I think they've realised now that actually maybe society in general has taken a more nuanced view of this and, and it isn't such a black and white issue. And I think Wes Streeting's comments reflect that. And Reem, just to bring you in, what are your thoughts on Wes Streeting's apparent change in his view on trans people? Do you buy it? Do you think this is a genuine moment of self-reflection for him or do you think he's thrown a particular group of people under the bus here? I think what's happened is that he's assessed the situation politically and I think the party has, I mean, primarily both parties have, look at figures like Penny Mordaunt in the Conservative Party that once again said trans women are women and then moved on and changed her mind during the leadership election. So again, I think it's really interesting. This report by Dr. Hilary Cass confirms the uh, reports that were in the interim back in 2022, which effectively says that, you know, gender dysphoria is real, but actually gender dysphoria services have let down children. Mm. And that actually allowing children to change their gender is damaging and is effectively uh, based on shaky evidence uh, within that report as well. So I do think it's really interesting and reflective of a slight shift in uh, focus on cultural issues. We haven't really been talking or hearing much about the cost of living or you know economic issues that are facing this country. Inflation seems to have uh, left the headlines despite the fact that uh, there seems to be some positive moves there. Actually, what seems to be at the forefront of, of these political uh, questions is the culture war, and it is but Reem, these key Reem, issues uh, I, like I, whether I, trans or women. I don't disagree with you, but I actually think it's a good thing, and I tried to say it yesterday because I wouldn't be able to, to say it in perhaps the right way that I want to. I think there are so many examples nowadays of people too terrified to have a debate about anything, and I think the trans debate is a perfect example of that. And you said it yourself, politicians tying themselves into knots. You remember that horrible woman and never like Nicola Sturgeon getting herself in. It was her seminal... It was the end of her career. She got herself or not. But I think we should have these debates without fear of offending people. And I think this Hillary Cass thing is a positive. But I will say, and I'm going to defend West Streeting, we criticise our politicians if they don't listen. We should also perhaps occasionally say, maybe they've listened and maybe they've said, I'm going to take it on the chin, I need to change their opinion. But it is still um, within UK law, isn't it, James, that somebody who has transitioned, be that mm. socially, surgically, whatever, will be legally recognised as being female if they have transitioned Absolutely. or male if they've transitioned to male. And, and, and you know, in fairness to Wes Streeting, you know, he went on to say, look, there is still a huge amount of discrimination and bigotry directed mm. towards trans people. That is a real issue. And I think the important thing about the cast review is it was looking specifically at children yes. with gender dysphoria yeah. and what the medical intervention should be there. Yeah. You know, there are many trans adults who absolutely deserve respect and dignity. And I don't think anyone, the government or the Labour Party, is somehow disputing that. I think the key thing about the cash review is how should we approach it when it comes to children, children. who are presenting with gender dysphoria. And The Guardian today in the front page here reporting that actually adult transgender clinics in England are facing a Hillary Cass style inquiry, but I, I'm totally with you. I think for so long, trans people have been used as a kind of political football. Reem touching on that yeah. perfectly there. Why aren't we talking about inflation? Why aren't we talking about the cost mm. of living crisis? It is an, is an important issue, um, but let's hope that politicians are held to account on other issues as well. Let's jump in, Reem. Uh, I want your, I want your opinion on this. Reem, you'll love this. 
Just 13% of Brits would trust Rishi Sunak to put up a shelf for new poll uh, today. Research carried out by JL Partners ask a wide range of Brits who they prefer to carry out certain tasks, ranging from the mundane to the serious. The poll pitted Rishi Sunak against Keir Starmer. Who would be better at leading them out of an escape room or putting up a shelf? Rishi Sunak's not very popular, Reem, is he, to be fair? <laughs> No, he isn't. And I think what's interesting about this, my favourite part of this, is they said 17% of respondents would have uh, w would have actually allowed Sunak to put a gun, uh, sorry, put out a kitchen fine. And there's one about the, him particularly, uh, whether or not he'd go to the pub. I think it was over 40% said that they would rather have a conversation with Starmer in the pub. I think it's really interesting because it speaks to the kind of personalities in politics. And I mean, just, just reflecting back on the previous question, on the previous topic, sorry, uh, on the front page of the Times, the, with the Hillary Cass interview, actually what this has done is it's embedded that kind of idea into legislation. Thames, Thames Valley Police, for example, back in 2019, said that you know if you are a uh, if, if you are reprinting the Oxford English Dictionary definition of what a woman is, that uh, it's an, women are adult human females, you could be liable for offence. So you, you 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 could be potentially arrested for that. So these kind of ideas are being embedded into legislation. Now, what's interesting about about this Guardian topic and actually talking about the way in which both Starmer and Sunak are actually presented to the public, it really is about personalities. It's about whether or not they're seen as being the next leader of this country. Have they both got a personality? Think Starmer is better. Have they both got a personality, do we think, on a serious note? Who, who? Well, I, I think Starmer's a bit like a wet cardboard, personally. Well, they but... say that Starmer will be better for a pub conversation. I love this. Rishi Sunak will be better negotiating a discount. The truth <laughs> is, Jay, the truth is, let's be honest, they're both probably what this country probably is crying out for after all the chaos, but they are a couple of boring buggers, I mean, they, if, I, if I were them, I would make a virtue of the fact that, yes, they are a bit dull, yeah. but they're serious-minded people. They are not Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn. We're in a worse position than we were under Boris Johnson. Well, some would say we're in a worse position because, because we had Boris Johnson. Johnson. But well, I think you're being unfair, both of you, to be honest. Hey, but, I, you know, I, I, Rishi Sunak is going to change so the world, what? and Rishi Sunak, the Tory party, is in free fall. How about what, Rishi, what, will, how what about I will Rishi... say is that what I will say is that Starmer and Sunak seem to be ideologically misaligned and actually don't have a particular direction. You know. Where, where does Sunak stand within the Conservative Party? We've got almost the highest tax burden since the Second World War. Out of all of his five pledges, only one of them has been met, and that's halving inflation. Really nothing to do with the government's policy at all. It's primarily to do with uh, the Bank of England's uh, sort of measures when it comes to I printing spoke the money to supply. An and I, spoke, I spoke to an aged Tory voter the other day in who looked me full square, no, in the face, and do you know what she said to me? He's a bit left wing, Sunak. He's he's not Tory at all. He is, he? is. and that's what now, you you yeah. We have different politics, but uh, traditional Tory voters, as Reen quite rightly said, low taxation, strong borders, a strong military, and fiscal responsibility. Look at Rishi Sunak's Conservative Party, and they laugh. Which is why we started this debate with West Streeting yeah. and Trans. The Labour Party has morphed almost. I think. Almost like Blair did in 97. They are an alternative to people because they're not seen as these people that are going to print money and give 30. But they are talking almost conservative language. Don't you agree? Well, the problem is for Rishi Sunak is no one quite knows where he stands there because he gets attacked from all sides. People on the right think he's because not right-wing he enough. He hasn't got, as Reem says, an ideology. There's nothing mm. that you follow him for. I think he lacks a bit of political confidence to actually plant his flag and say, this is where I stand on a given issue. He's trying to please all people, but he's pleasing no one. And he's wearing added trainers at the He's same time. He's wearing lovely Adidas <laughs> trainers. Well, thank you so much, James What's wrong Hansen. with his trainers? Yeah, oh, We'll everything. talk about that another Reem, time. thank you. Thank James, you, James thank you. Hansen thank you. and Reem Ibrahim down the line there. We spoke about the Shadow Health Secretary's comments earlier and new analysis out today reveals the shocking number of staff who are looking to leave the NHS. The figures show that almost half of NHS workers have looked for jobs outside of the service and 29% have actively inquired about non-NHS work. Hardly surprising. Last year, the health service launched its first long-term workforce plan, whatever that means, with a view to retaining current staff and boosting numbers. But stress, workload and staff shortages, the top reasons why workers say they are going to leave the NHS. Well, joining us now is the former NHS Trust Chair, Roy Lilly. Roy, good morning. Uh, morning, do, Roy. Do these new figures surprise you? No, they, they don't. I mean, we know, don't we? You know, we see it in the on the telly and the papers. You know, the NHS is chock-a-block and everybody's 
working flat out. What is interesting, I think, about this survey, the standout thing for me is that it's a four year longitudinal survey. So they looked at 1500 people over four years and they've pl they've kind of tracked their attitude. And although the, you know, the uh, the fact that somebody's looked at a job for, uh, outside the NHS isn't that significant. I mean, I think we all kind of do that. It does very much chime with my own experience of talking to people on the front line. Um, and there's two things really that I think are important when we talk about nurses, at least. Firstly, is that nurses can retire at 55. And nursing is becoming increasingly physical and, and a huge sort of physical effort. And a lot of nurses are saying, you know what, Roy, I've had enough. I'm going to retire when I can. So we're seeing early retirements. And also we're seeing a lot of youngsters now who once went into nursing because they sort of wanted a, a job for life. It was a career. Now they're saying, you know what, I want a job and a life. And a lot of them are leaving the NHS, which is which carries a big pension penalty for them. And they're working for agencies and coming back and working in the NHS at, at times and on shifts that suit them and their families. So the, I think those those two big demographic shifts are underlined in this study. And, and it's really quite worrying, I think. Roy, good to have you on, my friend. Um, th this is the bit that I... We sit and we talk about the NHS. We talk about conditions. We talk about money. We talk about it's busier than ever, but should you know, more people are going private. We talk about the mistakes that are made, et cetera, et cetera. How do you retain staff? I mean, I speak to striking junior doctors and nurses who are out on strike saying the working conditions are awful, the money's awful, it's vocational, we're not treated properly. You've got the other side of the coin that say, there's 200 billion quid or whatever. What? what you ran a trust. What is it? Why are staff so dissatisfied? Why is customer service so appalling? And, and, and is it, and, and I don't mean to be cynical, that it's just not fit for bleeding purpose anymore and we need to stop looking at it on some pedestal and accept that it isn't what it was and change it? Well, it, I mean, it certainly isn't what it was, that's true. And I think, I think that there's a combination of factors. I mean, certainly um, COVID knackered everybody and the NHS never got a chance to catch its breath um, because it was now under huge pressure for waiting lists. So I think that's it. I was talking to a trust chief executive yesterday and he was saying to me his cancer referrals, cancer referrals, which come with a timeline attached to them, are up by 50% a day. I was talking to some GPs recently. They're doing 1.3 million uh, uh, um, appointments a day. I mean, I've never seen the NHS so busy. That all makes work in the hospitals that much more that difficult. You have got an older population on more people, Roy. So if you were, my yeah. question is very simple. If you were back in charge of an NHS trust and your staff all wanted to leave, what would you do? Make better use of the if money? Would you be demanding more money? Would you be making them work for less? What? What would you do? I, I think it, a lot of it, I, I would focus on the nursing. 70% um, of nurses are female and a lot of them have caring duties as well. So I do what's called soft rotoring. So I'd, I'd, I would enable much more flexibility in rotoring. I'd make sure that my hospital had a creche. I'd make sure that my car parking was discounted for staff. I'd make sure that night duty staff didn't have to pay for overnight car parking. I'd make sure that I, my canteen was open. So I had hot meals 24 seven there's a lot of very basic simple things that you can do to make people's working day easier you can't you can't reduce the demand the demand is whatever the demand is but what you can say to your staff and you can never really say it often enough is look we absolutely value the fact that you're working here we want to make your life as easy as we can what can we do so a lot of it is is soft hr stuff that makes things easier for you know, changing facilities, showering facilities, all of that kind of thing, you can you can do that to make the life easier. And a lot of it is about rostering. At the moment, nurses work predominantly; they do three days back to back, twelve hours. Now, that's that's been a decision that was made a long time ago. Some of the hospitals now are refer are reverting back to eight hour shifts uh, on a on a, a two weekly rotor uh, to make it easier for people to transition from day into night and so on. So you've got to understand that, that these are family people. They are family, just like you and I. We have family responsibilities. We want to do things with our families. We've got to accommodate that. Some hospitals have actually started holiday clubs for kids uh, during the summer holidays, Roy, which are really these, very These important. seem like really very simple yet 
really effective, yes. potentially yes. very, very effective yes. changes. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I could talk to you about this all Good morning. Man, Roy, I wish you. you were in charge. Thank you so much. Yeah, why, <laughs> don't we, why don't we put him in charge of the health service? I would, know. Would you want just one final question? I'll get. Would you would you want more money or would you make better use of it? Make better use of it. Interesting. Interesting. Good man. Thank there we you. Go. Thank you so much, uh, Roy Lilly. There. We'll still to come on talk today. Joe Biden warns Iran not to launch an attack on Israel, <clears throat> and a well, well, does a well-spoken absolutely not. Does a well-spoken accent go against you in the work? Does a does a northern accent go against you? Now, writer uh, Emma Wolf and author James Bloodworth will take you through the papers next. Do please stay with us. Six twenty-four. We're live across the UK. This is Talk Today. I'm Jeremy Carl. A very, very. Good morning to you. See you in a minute. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 6.27. We will have the weather with Naz in just a minute, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. I'm definitely going to get this wrong. WikiLeaks whistleblower Julian Assange's charges could be dropped. That's in the papers next. <laughs> Did Prince Harry lie on his US visa application and could he be deported for it? More on that at 6.45 with Kinsey Schofield live from LA. Live. And today an increase in spousal visas comes into force, meaning if you earn less than 29 grand, you won't be able to bring dependents to the UK. We'll speak to one woman who's forced to live apart from a Brazilian husband and their two sons. But first, let's take a look at the weather with Naz. I'm sorry if Jeremy tells you off for whatever's happening with the weather. He always Better likes not. to shoot the messenger, but what's going on? 
You're going to like today's weather. Ooh. Why? What's happening? It's going to be warm. Yes. There'll be sunshine. Tomorrow? And mainly dry. Um, not so bad tomorrow. Either. But I bet you can't answer this because I'm a golf nut and okay. this is very interesting. Augusta oh. National, the Masters, of course, taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, starts today. Um, they're expecting 50 mile an hour winds and a complete cancellation of the first day and flooding, which is what we've had. The weather has been rubbish, hasn't it, mate? It has, actually. Parts of Wales and northern England have already had. Nine days into April, their monthly average. I'm not bothered about uh, Wales April. or the Northern England. I'm bothered yeah, about but, here. Uh, and Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about anymore. Let me just get on with the weather, <laughs> shall I? <laughs> Good girl. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Finally, some spring-like weather across much of the UK for today. Warm with good spells of sunshine. Not everywhere, but for most places. It's because the jet stream has moved further north. We're allowing high pressure to build, bringing mostly settled conditions. But over the next few days, we will still see fronts affecting northern parts and northwestern parts of the UK. Then as we head into the new week, it becomes cooler again with widespread showers. But there are hints of high pressure taking over once again. But before then, it's a fine, dry, bright and fairly mild start to the day and a warning free day in store for everywhere as well. There are spells of rain though across the southwestern and southern parts of the UK where it's quite cloudy, most of it light and patchy nature and it is rather murky mist fog, sea fog around these areas as well. And that's that cold front that's going to be lingering across parts of the south for much of today. But for Scotland this afternoon, lots of sunshine on the cards, a few showers possible, but very few and far between. And the northeast may be a tad cloudy. Plenty of sunshine for Northern Ireland and England and Wales will see bright or sunny spells throughout today. So for most in the sunshine with a mild southwesterly flow as well, it is going to be feeling quite warm. Temperatures could locally get up to highs of 19 to 20 degrees Celsius anywhere around the East Midlands towards East Anglia, I think, seeing those highest temperatures. Because along the south coast, that cold front lingers, bringing with it cloudy skies, patchy light rain and drizzle, and probably staying quite murky around the southeast and western coasts. Now, overnight, we'll see a front uh, merge across parts of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Central Southern Scotland, and and northern parts of England. So spells of rain there, but it will be a mild night everywhere. Temperatures remaining in double figures and it will be mainly dry, but quite cloudy across parts of the south. Then for tomorrow, we see more of a northwest southeast divide. So northwestern areas of the UK for Scotland, for Northern Ireland, the Republic, quite cloudy with patchy outbreaks. The rain still remaining quite mild and towards the northeast of Scotland, still a lot of fine and bright weather. England and Wales, on the other hand, seeing plenty of sunshine and warmth. And tomorrow we could see the highest temperature of the year so far in the southeast with the dizzy heights of 21 to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Before we go through the papers, I should acknowledge we have a new floor manager today, Maddie, who's very cool, everybody else is off, but she's actually got Rishi Sunak Samba trainers on. <laughs> she Quite does. Worrying. She's She'll put up a shelf for Prime you. Minister. Uh, right, today's papers with the legend that is Emma Wolf and the legend that still is uh, author James Bloodworth. Morning, one and all. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. James, you're going to kick us off with the front page of The Telegraph. Biden warns Iran not to attack Israel. Yeah, so Iran's been threatening a retaliationary strike for... So on the 1st of April, Israel um, bombed Damas uh, Damascus and a consulate building belonging to Iran, killed some of their generals. And since then, Iran's been threatening to retaliate. And yeah. Joe Biden's saying that if, if Iran attacks Israel in any way, um, the United States will, sta will stand squarely with Israel. So, I mean, the long and short of it is... Uh, there's a risk of the US getting dragged into a regional conflict. Um, em, the bit I don't get, and I spoke to, uh, to Jay about this upstairs, is as follows. I thought that Joe Biden really might use uh, the strength that he could show diplomatically to sort of quash a little bit of Trump. Got a mixed messaging. Mm. Uh, first of all, you better not, Israel, you need your break in law, stop doing this, it's a humanitarian crisis. Next day, ironclad support against Iran. Mixed messaging from that Joe Biden, to be fair, no? That was exactly my thought. The last few days yeah. have been very, very mixed messages. You, you got over the top, Joe. I don't know what you're thinking about. Uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, what, what does he actually mean? Because I think he needs to be clearer on this. I think that, you know, it's not actually... Probably sums uh, up how, not un how unclear okay, he probably he's is. In is. He's, he's in a bit of a difficult position, though, as well. I think Netanyahu is becoming a, a liability for Israel, but also for the United States. Yeah. I mean, he, Joe Biden has to stand with Israel against Iran. 
But at the same time, he doesn't want to be in this be put in this position Guess by he's Netanyahu. Got a with the Democratic Party as well. He's got to try and please all sides, isn't he? Yeah. That attack on the consulate. How has that played out in terms of geopolitics? Like, what what's the the general feeling about that? Because obviously, it should certainly be understood that if Iran was being bombed, they're likely to at least threaten mm -hmm. to retaliate. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's happened in Damascus, which is you know. Syria is a dictatorship. It's allied with Iran. They've been there's been tit for tat. So Hezbollah has been attacking Israel for a yeah. long time. So I mean, it, the, the the diplomats in in Syria. I mean, it's kind of fair game. But if it escalates into attacks in Iran or in uh, Israel itself, then it becomes a kind of more regional war, and then the United States potentially gets dragged in, which is which is worrisome for all of us because yeah. again, Russia can get dragged into that as well. Should we stay with President Biden now? Yeah, go. Because he said that he's considering dropping the prosecution of Julian Assange. What can you tell us about this story? Yeah, so um, yeah, there's an extradition uh, potentially ha been ongoing for a long time um, for Julian Assange being on 17 ex ex espionage charges. Uh, for Julian Assange to be extradited to the United States. So he was a long time uh, cooped up in the Ecuadorian embassy. That came yeah. to an end. Um, and Biden's, you know, mulling over the idea of maybe this this case is actually going to be dropped against Assange. There's, there's, Electioneering? I don't know, really. But it's, I, I can understand there's been protests from the Australian government, for example, um, to the US saying, you know, the, these charges should be dropped. And certainly he should not face the death penalty. Um, but on the other hand... I think we, we should remember that Julian Assange, you know, some of the information he did give to, uh, he did release, um, jeopardise the lives of people in Iran, Iraq and um, uh, other countries. People who'd helped the West then subsequently disappeared mm. in those countries. So, em, uh, thoughts? Yeah, it's complex. I go back and forth on the Assange one. As a, as a man, as a personality, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, keen on him and I find him sort of slightly uh, suspicious, but I also feel... Kind of just ideologically, I feel that you know releasing the truth about things there's something right about that. So I, you know, I'm, I, I think. Can I just point out for people tuning in? The Australian link is Australian, and the Australian yeah, yes. government is saying he's ours, sending home because he's in custody in England. Yeah. Uh, Emma, can we go to the yeah. Express? Yeah. Um, patients are benefiting from quicker treatment, which crucially is freeing up hospital beds in a radical shake-up of healthcare. Now, forgive me, having just spoken to Roy Lilly, if I sound cynical, yeah. I can't get away from the fact that the NHS isn't fit for purpose. We've got an older population, a bigger population. We seem to be... We revere it. All oh, this great... It's a fantastic idea. What does that mean? Oh, benefit, be, patients are benefiting from quicker treatment, which is freeing up hospital beds. I'm 58. I've never worked in the NHS. My four-year-old son could have told you that. What's this about? Well, exactly. This is a radical new... Quick it up and you'll get more done. Yes. Who knew? Speed things up. It's called the SDEC, Same Day Emergency Care. Suddenly, it seems that they're able to treat, uh, diagnose, treat and discharge people on the same day, which begs the question, Jeremy Carl, why weren't they doing this before? Yeah. They're now starting to get more and people And begs in. the question back, Emma Wolf. precisely, what... what the, I mean, Nick, what, what, this is ridiculous, man. What has, what has changed? I apologise, sorry, my phone... Put your phone on silent, sorry. Kyle, my there goodness. Yes. So what, what has actually changed here? What, what is this radical plan and who, who's implemented it? Well, these are same-day units. It means that basically patients don't have to stay in overnight. It means that doctors, as I say, can diagnose, treat and get people out in and out same day, which is wonderful for patients. Frees up, you know, we've got millions... This is, the NHS is in crisis. We've got millions on waiting lists. We yeah. really, really have. People need especially emergency care because of the problems in primary care, because of the problems in social care. Yeah. Mm. People are ending yeah. up in A&E needing help. Really Often interesting that Roy Lilly, ex-chief ex, 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 ex yeah. executive of a trust, talked about, you know, making working conditions easier. I also mm. asked him about money and he went, it needs to be spent better. This is a classic example, is it not, of common sense, man. Yeah, I mean, this is this feels a bit like a puff piece uh, because as the, the item you had just before, you had someone saying that, you know, the, there's a big recruitment crisis in mm. the NHS. You've got 47% of staff looking for jobs outside the, the NHS. And we have, you know, one in five nursing roles not not filled at the moment. So the, the thing is, you have to make the NHS somewhere people actually want to work. And I think that will go a long way to actually sort, sorting yeah. it out, making it improving its results. Emma, I just want to move us on now because I really want to cover this story mm. in the mirror. Caroline Flack's mother has spoken out saying, I will get the truth. Can you tell yeah, us more? Yeah, um, I mean, I hadn't realised there was there, there's real kind of controversy around her arrest. She, so Caroline was arrested in December 2019. She was cautioned about the this alleged assault on her boyfriend and then took her own life in February 2020, three months later. Um, and her mother has been on this campaign for about four years now to, to find out 
really what went on around that arrest, because there was an officer present who then didn't give evidence later. The arrest, I think the caution was overturned. Police did not record why they appealed against the CPS caution. Uh, there was another officer present at the arrest. And so the mother, the, um, Caroline's mother, um, what's her name, Christine, yep. wants to know really what went on around her daughter's... Um, because it, it caused real distress for uh, Caroline Flack. She stepped down from Love Island immediately. Another Channel 4 programme that she'd already filmed was cancelled. Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Channel 4. Yeah, right, Channel 4. With you. Yeah, um, was cancelled, and obviously it was t it was a terrible time for her those last few months. Yeah. And so there's a, there's questions that need to be answered. Her mother is saying. No words, love. To, to, don't get me on this. Yeah, uh, I just can't I'd imagine. Talk. I, I've spent I've spent a long time arguing with people about you know duty of care to all sorts of people in all sorts of systems. Caroline Flat was a wonderful girl who was yeah. not looked after by anybody at the end. Now, I'm not talking about her mother was an amazing human being. Yeah. It's a talented, talented girl who needed help, OK? And whether it's the police or certain television organ, it doesn't matter, OK? Don't get me on it, but what a loss. Mm. I loved a, a, her. Yeah, a huge loss. I loved her. And, you know... Good Just, for Chris, Christine for actually Yeah, good fighting, for Christine, actually, because you know what? It's, 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 not a, it's not about pointing the finger. It's about a kid that was struggling, right? Yeah. I think sometimes... I think sometimes we talk about... Oh, everybody struggles. This girl was struggling. She's got nothing. That's an opinion. Yeah, and also for the same mistakes, if there have been any mistakes, uh, to not be made again. But we've got about 30 seconds. I just really want to talk about this final story, What's this? Emma. Um, Jan Leeming, a Jan TV, Leeming? TV broadcaster, has said that TV is mangling language and because she, she suggested that she no longer gets work because of her essentially posh accent. She's basically saying, she says, I'm too well-spoken. So 82-year-old Jan Leeming to a newsreader. I think you might don't be, know. she's not posh enough. New, newsreader, <laughs> stage, TV actress as well. Yes. She's basically saying, you know, because of RP, because of received pronunciation, she speaks like I do, basically. Yeah, you, you've got that perfect kind of RP. Um, I mean, you're not very posh. You're I'm sort not, of no, semi. No. What's your accent, James? Uh, a, a twinge of Somerset, I think. Yeah, a yeah. little yeah, bit. Yeah, right. There. Right, right on there, 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 right, mate? But I don't think that's why. I mean, I think there, there's some... Are you so, saying it's because she's 82? Maybe. Some oh, Not JB. that that's right, but some research came out recently saying that TV has actually got posher recently. Has in it? Recent years. Yeah, well, all of these, prof all the cultural professions have. Oh, well, better So I don't, think, well, that's I don't you, think that's, that's you stuff, that's, mate. That's isn't it? Let's get on big one on Blackpool, have fun, <laughs> right? Like it, do, like what? No, what? No, I was, my mother always taught me to speak the Queen's English. Yeah, me too. And I'm very, very happy to do it. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Emma. Thank you, James. More in just yes, under an hour. Yes, they will be back in just under an hour. Yeah, they'll be back in an hour. Right, you at home, you've been getting in touch you with have. your views and opinions all morning. Earlier we were talking about Wes Streeting, who was waded into the, the so-called gender row, calling the NHS treatment, uh, some NHS treatment, I think it's worth pointing out, scandalous. Is he right to support the cast review, we've asked you? Uh, Sarah says he's only supporting the cast review because he knows which way the wind is blowing. He has zero principles. Malcolm says last year he agreed with it, now he doesn't. Not a surprise. We know it's election year. Malk, I sort of agree with you with all politicians. No, Suddenly there's a raft of policies from the Tories. Labour are moving, but, you know... I... I think, yeah, I think it's the other way around, actually, Malcolm. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's unclear exactly what Malcolm's referring to there, but he certainly doesn't disagree with the report no. now. He does agree with it. Leo is interesting. Yes, Leo. What, the, the name is interesting. No, no, oh, no, right. Leo, not as bad as Jeremy. <laughs> on. Leo says, after years of being on the wrong side, watching West Streeting and Labour scrabble to get on the right side shows how, opportuni how opportunistic our politicians are. How can they change their genuine moral and political positions frequently whilst holding... No shame. You might be surprised by what I think about this. We moan at our politicians for not listening. I do think politicians can change their mind. My sure. cynicism would be it's election year, and frankly, I think any of them will say anything to get your vote. Talk today at talk.tv. Text 28722. Start your message with the word talks. Quarter 20 to 7, I Thorpey. Know. Where's the time gone? Well, to royal news now, and Prince Harry has been fighting to prevent the release of his American visa application after concerns were raised about the legitimacy of his documentation. I don't like him, but there we go. Thank Think tank, whatever, brought the case after Harry revealed in his memoir Spare that he'd taken cocaine, cannabis and magic mushrooms. Lying about past drug use is in breach of US federal law and could impact on Prince Harry's immigration status. There you go. Well, here to tell us if we can expect Harry to be sent back home, Kinsey no, Schofield. No. Kinsey joins us uh, live from LA. Kinsey, do you think that it's likely that this application will become public? Well, I mean, I think it is kind of wild to 
imagine Judge Carl Nichols looking through these papers potentially right now and actually seeing what all this hubbub is about. Uh, you know, because at, at first the Heritage Foundation, when they asked to see this information, it did come off as a potentially maybe just kind of like a PR stunt. What what was the ultimate objective? And we've slowly actually moved closer to you know actually getting some potential real information here as to whether or not Prince Harry lied on his visa application or received special treatment from the government. Um, you know, under a Biden administration, I think Prince Harry is ridiculously safe. But we have seen Trump throughout his presidential campaign over the last few months say that if he finds out that Prince Harry lied on his visa application, he refuses to protect him. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because you, you can further look into depth about um, the, the, the American election because they're saying that they are they are quite involved. I've, I've, I've read your comments that Me Meghan Markle participated in multi-voter awareness digital campaigns in 2020 and she and he appeared on the Times' most influential special for ABC News uh, before where they, where they sort of endorsed Biden, didn't they? So, I mean, they are known, I presume, she would absolutely loathe everything that Donald Trump stands for. So is this another attempt at them? I don't know. Why? why sorry, maybe I missed the point. Why have they got anything to do with the US presidential election? Why don't they just shut up and get on with their lives? Why are they so important? I don't understand. Well, I, I mean, just, I don't know if I am able to transition into this story. Don't but talk about transitioning. Oh my <laughs> don't start announced. that. It's a whole debate. Don't. I, I, I know. Uh, we, it was just announced that their charity, Archwell, has partnered with uh, Miles Taylor of the Future Us to help voters against disinformation. And this is a campaign, they call it a bipartisan coalition, uh, that Harry and Meghan and other Hollywood power players are uh, partnering with to help the you know normal people determine what's deep fake what is ai generated and to help them kind of navigate this political season um which i think is wild considering the fact that prince harry took a phone call from who he thought was greta thunberg spent half an hour <laughs> talking on the phone to her about politics and his personal life and that was pranksters on youtube um but yet yeah, they're definitely highly invested in politics and you know there were rumors forever that megan wanted to run in some way shape or form she's written congress people about things i can't tell you why but i do know that that is something that they're both very passionate well, maybe, about maybe sitting this side of the pond we're missing the point because if donald trump uh, can run for president, and Joe Biden, who doesn't know his own name, maybe Meghan Markle will, in fact, run for president of the United States of America. And, and our royal prince could be the first husband, or whatever that would be. It certainly won't be for the election, the upcoming election. It'd be funny, though, this, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, it would be very funny. Um, <laughs> almost as funny as Donald Trump. Um, prince William... Kinsey has broken his silence yeah, has. since um, Catherine's cancer diagnosis. I don't believe he's commented on it specifically, but he sent out a message to the lionesses, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, and I think to me what it, it was very generic. It was very sweet and congratulations, thank you. I, I think Prince William acknowledging and celebrating Rachel Day on social media gives us the sense that things are maybe normal behind the scenes, which is uh, un undeniably a relief to us all um, that he's engaged or interested in some of those passion projects he had prior to the chaos that's to overtaken us throughout 2024 so far. Um, we won't see Prince William until April 17th or after April 17th because he is on holiday with his family. But it just was nice to have a back to normal kind of feel from Prince William away from some of the heartache we've experienced over the last few weeks. Can I just say, um, I know I'm married, but if I didn't wake up with you every morning, I wouldn't feel complete. I love you, Kinsey Schofield. Thank you. You're very Thanks, great. Jeremy Kyle. Uh, I, Thank I you. mean it. I feel quite. I feel quite emotional. Uh, still to come. Thank you, Kins. Uh, the minimum wage required for Brits to bring their foreign partners to the UK is rising today. We're discussing the impact this will have on thousands of citizens. That's next. This is Talk Today. It is six forty-seven. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You were told today it's almost 10 to 7. Now, from today, the minimum threshold for people bringing a partner to the, or spouse to the UK has increased by over 10 grand, from 18,000 to 29,000 pounds, my friends. Well, one person who will feel the impact of this change is Raquel Roberts, whose husband, Manuel, is struggling to stay in the UK because she doesn't meet this criteria. Good morning, Raquel. Now, this is a significant rise. How is this going to affect uh, you and your family? Uh, it's, it's, it's disastrous, really, isn't it? Um, and it's not just my family either. We're talking about thousands of families. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very distressing situation. Um, it's totally hypocritical of a, of a party that, um, claims to put for family values at the forefront of their policies because they're doing exactly the opposite of that. Um, and it's an amount now where 50% of the UK population do not earn enough to sponsor a foreign spouse. So that means 50% of the population can now no longer fall in love with a foreigner, or if you do, you're exiled. You have to leave the UK. Um, Raquel, can you just tell us, <laughs> tell us a bit more about your story, how you met your husband and, and your two sons and where they are at the moment. Um, OK, so uh, we have known each other some 16 years. Um, we have been together 10 years. We have been married nine years. Uh, and our first son was born eight years ago. So, um, you know, this is not some kind of holiday romance or whim or anything. Um, I actually have a master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Uh, and applied language linguistics. So um, 
I have been abroad working. Um, I came back, uh, we came back 2019, there had been some unfavorable, pretty scary incidents happened. Um, and essentially uh, I was teaching here at a private language college um, on my way to a, making the minimum income requirement and then COVID struck. Um, so we were in that period of, because to apply, the Brit and only the Brits, and this is where the UK is now the harshest country in the world for this type of visa, um, the Brit par partner has to be in this country earning the minimum income requirement for a period of six months before they can apply to bring their Raquel, partner with can them. I, can I jump in? Because um, we've spoken yep. to you before and I have, <laughs> I have sympathy with you. I, I just want to read this. I'm not taking the opposite view. Home Office spokesman said the current levels of migration to the UK are far too high. You talk about a party and a government about family values. They will say... Migration is something that is at the forefront of everybody's minds and many people in this country want that as a situation sorted. What I'd like, briefly, before we take in David Haig, is how would you respond to that? What would you say to that? OK. Um, I could show you pictures of 22 Tory MPs who are married to foreign spouses. Okay. They're hypocrites. Mm. Next. But family visas account for 5% of all legal visa stamped entry. That's tiny compared to the whole situation. Uh, we, they, the government haven't even been able to publish an inequality impact assessment. The impact assessment that they have published uh, shows that they just do not know how much this is actually going to affect their numbers because there are so many value, variables for, on family visas. Um, they think that it could be anywhere between 10 and 30,000 families. Um, and uh, yeah, what, how can you put any kind of price on family? Okay, these kids, they stay. need their family. They need families. Yeah, stay need there. Family. Don't disagree with that. Let's bring in human rights law very briefly. David Haig, really, really quickly, my friend. Sorry, timing. You know, you know, lots of people going through this at the moment. I gave out what the Home Office is saying. You know, migration levels are too high. There's a there's an issue here, though, isn't there? Just briefly, what would your what would your view of this situation be? Yeah, good, good morning to you both. I mean, very briefly, I mean, I think, you know, you, Rick, Rick Hell's put it better than, than, than I could. This is nothing more than the cruel destruction of British families for short-term political gain. These, these figures are insignificant when you come to the absolute broken immigration system that we're facing. It's a couple of percent per, per people that come in on these visas, and they are British families. These are not families coming across um, from, from other countries. These are British families that have been broken. The fingers are insignificant. And like I said, it's effectively cooking the books to get some, some, some cheap political wins. It doesn't seem to be dealing with the absolute issue of migration yes. as we know. And also, really the quickly, boats. David, it, it favours wealthy people. It's not actually stopping people coming into the country. Why not do it on another basis, whether you've got, whether you're a father of two children, you know, how close your ties are to the UK rather than on money? Absolutely. I mean, it's effectively half the country, pretty much half the country, particularly in deprived areas where I'm from Cornwall, wouldn't be able to marry who they love or bring their children um, if they are under a certain income level. And that's just wrong. Love shouldn't be about, I don't want to become too much of a human rights point here, but you know, love shouldn't be about money. Love I wish, we had, I wish we had more time, Raquel. Yeah. We wanted to get you on. David, is ever, although I have a slight opinion here. I think I've never seen David Bull and David Haig in the same room. <laughs> I think they are one as... I, honestly, I don't believe that's that David Haig. I think that's Bull pretending to be a human rights lawyer. <laughs> Thank you, gang. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this morning. Raquel Roberts there and human rights lawyer David, David Haig. David Bull. Well, still to come on the show, our correspondent Nick Ellaby will be in Bradford as a man is charged with murder following the death of a mother who was stabbed as she pushed her little baby in a pram. It's an awful story. We'll cover it next. This is Talk Today. Very good morning. We're coming right back. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to have another moved on era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning, it's 7am on Thursday, the 11th of April. You would talk today, we're on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. These are Thursday morning's top stories, my friends. Developments overnight in Bradford as 25-year-old Habiba Masoom is charged with murdering a mother who was stabbed while she pushed her baby in a pram. A trans treatment row ignites in the Labour Party after the shadow health secretary West Streeting yesterday threw his support behind the cast review. And sex ed shock. Nearly a fifth of teenagers say that the internet is their main source of information on sexual health. We'll ask Conservative MP Caroline Noakes for her thoughts this hour. And finally, a warm day with sunshine. But not everywhere, I'm afraid. I'll have the full details of the forecast a little later. Oh, sorry, just looking for sex on the internet. Uh, Emily's got the news headlines. Oh, what a throw. Good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masum, who's 25, is due to appear at Bradford Magistrates Court this morning. He's also charged with possession of a knife. The US president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said the US's commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. One person has been killed and five others injured, including two children, after gunmen opened fire in a residential area of Washington, D.C. Investigators believe the suspects left a car and began shooting at people on the street. Police have issued a public alert for the car that fled the scene. We are working v tirelessly to, to really help remove some of these illegal guns that are on our streets. We're working with our ATFs. We're working with some of our task force. Uh, what we're seeing is an increase of guns in the district, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're removing those guns off of our streets. 
Here and nearly half of NHS staff are looking for a new job outside the service. Figures released today found 47% of people have spent time looking at job adverts to leave the NHS, while around a third had actively inquired about it. Well, former NHS Trust Chair Roy Lilly has told Talk Today he's not surprised. We're seeing a lot of youngsters now who once went into nursing because they sort of wanted a, a job for life. It was a career. Now they're saying, you know what, I want a job and a life. And a lot of them are leaving the NHS. And a once a day pill to treat migraines has been given the green light on the NHS in England, which could help relieve symptoms in more than 170,000 people. A todgepant will be an option for frequent sufferers who've tried at least three other treatments without success. But there are calls this morning for the life <laughs> Why are you laughing? Changing pill to be made more accessible on the NHS as quickly as possible. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. You're laughing at the name of the migraine I pill. Aren't you? Your pants. You looked at, so when I said it, you both looked up so so confused at what I just said. So sorry, <laughs> mate, it's called the Todger Todger I think that's how you pronounce it. My goodness. What's it for? My I'm listening to you when you're speaking. What's the todgy pill for? It's migraine. It's, it's the, the migraine. Revolutionary pill. So of if you're waking up this morning, if you're a man, the way to get over a headache is to put your todger in some tight <laughs> pants. I, I mean, <laughs> Emily, <laughs> Emily right, Adams, crazy. well done, you. Thank you, Em. And can I just say, Thank on you. a serious note, you know, the thing about the news uh, on a daily basis is so much of it is dark and miserable, yeah. but occasionally it is right and proper to have a laugh. But before we get back to that terrible story in Bradford, can I also just point out, um, loads of you responding this morning, and we will get to you. Uh, please keep your thoughts coming. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. You might want to talk about the gender debate that's mm. now ignited in the Labour Party after Wes Streeting yesterday said that Cass report is very good. You might respond, you might have seen Roy Lilly, ex-trust CEO, uh, talking about the NHS, uh, which apparently nearly 30% of people who work in the NHS want out. Why do you think that is? Is it, is, it, is it because people don't like hard work? Is it because the NHS is not doing enough? We'd love your opinions on those two things. Talk today at Talk to TV and text to 8722. Absolutely. Well, we start this morning in Bradford, where a 25-year-old man has been charged over the murder of a mother who was stabbed to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. Habiba uh, Masoom from Burnley will appear in court later today after he was arrested during a four-day manhunt following the killing of 27-year-old Kasuma actor on Saturday. Well, our correspondent Nick Ellaby joins us from Bradford. Nick, good morning. What's the latest? Good morning, Nicola. Good morning, Jeremy. So the facts of this case that we know so far is that Habiba Masum, who's 25, known to be a resident of Burnley, will appear at Bradford Magistrates Court behind me later this morning, charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. It follows the killing of Kulsuma actor, who was 27, here in Bradford in the centre. It was an attack that happened on Saturday in broad daylight in the afternoon. And as you say, she was pushing her pram, another shocking detail of this shocking case. Uh, that intersection where, where she was attacked is just a mile from here, just on the other side of, of the centre of Bradford. Uh, her cousin of Miss Actors has described her as loving, caring, humble, and also having a gift to make people laugh. And her mother, who's living in Bangladesh, is reported to be constantly crying. Now, Habib Masum was arrested 150 miles to the south of here in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire on Tuesday morning. That followed a four-day manhunt. Police raided places in Chester, in Oldham, and in Burnley as well. Uh, and as I say, four days that manhunt before Habib Masum was arrested on Tuesday. Four other men have been arrested uh, in connection with this case. They're being held and questioned uh, on suspicion of aiding an offender and also on drugs charges as well. And there's another man uh, who was also arrested in Chester, uh, but he's been bailed. So, you know... As I say, Habib Masum appearing at Bradford Magistrates Court later this morning. Four other men being held and questioned in connection with this case on suspicion of, of assisting an offender. And West Yorkshire Police have also referred themselves to the watchdog, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, because they had contact with Miss Acta uh, before she was killed. Uh, and, but that headline again, Habib Masum, 25 years old, known to be a resident of Burnley, will appear later this morning at Bradford Magistrates Court behind me uh, on charge of murder 
and possession of a bladed article. Guys. Nick, thank you for now. Nick Ellaby live in Bradford. We will, as a station, update you throughout the day. And what is a horrific story? And you heard it's very difficult because it's a legal situation. There's stuff still ongoing with the police inquiry, but um, the force has uh, sort of given itself names and said, you know, we were contacted by this woman. You look at that, you mm. consider that four accomplices hit a man who allegedly murdered a woman. That's another thing that needs looking at, but more of that throughout the day. Well, Times Radio presenter James Hansen is back with us in the studio, and we're also joined by Sunday Times columnist John Boothman down the line. Uh, James, let's talk about the NHS treatment of kids questioning mm. their gender. Um, where Streeting was on Never Mind the Ballots last night, and he said to Harry Cole from The Sun that some of these treatments were scandalous. Yeah, and it's really interesting, actually, the Labour response to this. And I think it's indicative of actually quite a big shift in both tone and policy. Well, I'll Labour. tell you what, if you're OK, we talk about tone, yeah. we talk about shift. This was a this was a 360 or a 180, yeah. whatever it is. Have a, have a watch, have a listen to West Street yesterday, my friend. They ran a campaign saying trans women are trans, trans women, are women get over it. Do you agree with that? Mm, uh, no, it's to the extent that, that... And I say this with some self-criticism and reflection. If you'd asked me a few years ago uh, on this topic, I would have said, trans men are men, trans women are women, some people are trans, get over it, let's move on, this is, this is all blown out of proportion. And now I sort of sit and reflect and think, actually, there are lots of complexities and challenges. Isn't that the problem, though? Leading debate. figures like yourself, and I'm not just singling you out, but leading figures like yourself were saying, get over it, no, when I, people, I were, trying to, when people right. were trying to raise the facts. Do you regret? No, I think you regret? I absolutely take the criticism on the chin. It's really interesting, James, isn't it? I'll bring John in a minute. We said it in the last hour. Is this a politician who is doing what we want our politicians to do, which is to listen and understand? This is a very, very contentious debate, but one that needs to be had without fear of being called transphobic. Or is this a Labour Party doing whatever it needs to do to get elected? Well, I think Labour have realised that they were maybe at risk of being out of step with the public on this, because a couple of years ago, you would have Labour front benches regularly on the media struggling to answer a basic question like, how would you define a woman? And getting mm. into a bit of a pickle over that. And look, there has been pushback from, from many within the Labour Party against what Wes Streeting has said and the fact that he's come out so wholeheartedly and welcomed the findings of the Cash Review. Momentum, remember them very big in the Jeremy Corbyn days? Mm. They've come out and criticised Wes Streeting, thinking that he plays into, as they would say, a narrative of transphobia. But I think, to be clear, you know, the Cash Review was not talking about, you know, somehow condoning transphobia or questioning people's right to transition. Mm. It was specifically addressing how do we treat children with children, gender dysphoria? Children, absolutely. And is it right to give them what are essentially puberty blockers to stop a very significant development in their biology. So it is really interesting how Labour have shifted on this. And I think it shows that they're serious about trying to get into government. I, I, th I, think, I think that's the point. If I could bring in John Boothman, um, Sunday Times columnist, just quickly, John, and we'll talk about Scotland in a minute. It's interesting, isn't it? The CAST report, I think the majority of people would say, is, it, is, a, is a balanced way of looking at something. Momentum jump up, you just said it. It's a narrative of transphobia. That's why we've got a problem, because people have been too scared to have the debate. Surely it's a good thing, John Boothman, isn't it? It's taken us four years to get here, four years since this report was commissioned. Uh, I think she's done us all a favour. Uh, she's brought out an objective report. She's, a, she's really rejected the extremes. Um, and I think that's something that we should all welcome. Um, you know, we are talking about, and if you look at what she said, the medicalisation of children um, with scant evidence that this is a good idea. I mean, it is pretty unbelievable. I was saying to people yesterday, it's like returning to a medieval debate between science and men in funny hats and red suits where their beliefs um, trump everything else. Um, and the fact of the matter is, this this is not where the public are. I think everybody's right this morning. This is Labour returning to the mainstream. They've got themselves into a bit of a mess over all of this. I've seen the Conservatives move, and now they're moving to... Do you think there's a danger, John, that this report, um, as moderate as, as it is, could be weaponised by people who are transphobic and do want to push a kind of hateful agenda against trans people? 
Look, this this debate's going to continue. It's not going to go away. One of the things that's interesting about it, reasonable though it is, is that, you know, by saying that we want a more holistic approach, which I think everybody, any reasonable person would welcome, uh, there needs to be more support for kids in this position. Um, it's yet another demand that we're placing on the health service. Well, I, um, I agree. Can I, can I, there's other stuff, but can I just say support in my opinion, should not be medicalisation straight away. You could spend years having psychological help and counselling to understand this is a monumental decision. Sorry, I, I think I think her report has opened people's minds. We had you on specifically, well, because obviously you're great and you're cheap, to be fair, JB, but more importantly, <laughs> uh, Scottish hate crime. Um, God, I have to calm down. Police in Scotland were swamped with thousands of anonymous complaints in the first week since your controversial new hate crime laws took effect. What the hell's going on? 7,000 complaints. Why? Because people didn't like what? What were they moaning about? 7,800 complaints, uh, mostly from anonymous people, uh, as a result of this new legislation. The legislation was introduced three years ago. Um, we're only getting round to enforcing it now on the basis that it's too difficult to enforce. I mean, basically, the police have had to deal with a, an absolute slew of vexatious complaints, uh, people complaining, giving their opinion anonymously, uh, that they don't like the sort of things, for example, that J.K. Rowling said about um, a variety of issues, including trans issues on Twitter. Um, they've concluded at the end of the day that only 240 of these amount to crimes. It's been a monumental waste of police time. Like, they've got, a no like they've got nothing else to do. Like, you know, without being rude, this entire country, England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, is decimated. We've got not enough police men and women. We've got crime everywhere. What's going on? Well, the police in Scotland have already said that they're not going to tackle low-level crimes like wow. property theft. They're not going to tackle low-level crimes relating to, for example, people breaking into cars. And yet they've said that in this case they're going to investigate every single complaint that's been made. Mm. Now, there's a report out this morning from Her Majesty's Inspectorate in Scotland talking about how police are burnt out, they're overburdened, there are a 1,000 officers shot in Scotland. Um, this is not a good place, the Scottish Parliament itself. I mean, its whole legislative process has been called into question. Um, we've had loads of bills now, half a dozen bills that have all been turned over as pretty poor legislation, some by the Supreme Court, others by the Scottish Court, including including gender reform legislation. Um, it's all a bit of a mess, and it's really, really affecting the, both the police badly and the reputation, as I said, of the Parliament. Well, I, 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 I got slaughtered some time ago for slagging off Nicola Sturgeon, but I actually think the one thing that I have every right in saying is the genuine people of Scotland. This morning, a report says that Labour is ahead of the SNP in Scotland politically and in the polls for the first time in... I don't know how long. All those people who paid John Booth and their subscription and bought into what Nicola Sturgeon said was going to happen must feel really cheated as of today. Do you not think I'm right in that? Cheated. I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. We're talking about a situation where there's two polls in the last 24 hours. Um, really, this is the first time that Labour's been ahead in terms of percentage share of the vote since 2014. Since there's the been a huge effort. collapse over the past few years in the SNP's vote. Um, you yourself referring to Nicola Sturgeon. It started really that drop before she left. It's continued under well a, a first minister um, where misfortune for follows them around. Um, this week we've had even more problems in the SNP apart from that hate crime bill. You may have read yesterday that his brother-in-law was arrested for extortion and abduction, which is, you know, pretty astonishing news. I never now, that's thought... Not, just, John, not, just not within, yeah. No, no, just let me bring in James just very quickly, and I appreciate it. I never thought that Hamza Yous Youssef, I nearly called him Yousef, was going to be able to succeed because he was Sturgeon's lapdog. Yeah. And it's really difficult. When you take over from someone, you've got two choices. You either embrace their yep. legacy or you define yourself against them. And this is part of the problem Rishi Sunak's girl. He actually has not come in and, and provided enough of a difference between what went before. He actually called out Liz Truss's economic policies when he ran for the Tory leadership. He never says that now. And if he did, he might be able to define himself more against her in the eyes of the voters. And Hamza Yousaf has that problem because he was very close to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, John Boothman, brilliant. Could have done all morning with both of you. James Hanson, for now, thank you very much indeed. Thank you both. Now, we've been speaking about the Shadow Health Secretary this morning. A new analysis out today reveals the shocking number of staff looking to leave the NHS 
Well, the figures show that almost half of NHS workers have looked for jobs outside of the service and 29% have actively inquired about non-NHS work. Now, last year, the health service launched its first long-term workforce plan, whatever that means, with a view to retaining current staff and boosting numbers, but stress, workload and staff shortages are the top reasons why workers say they are leaving the surface. Well, Dr Basha Mukherjee, a junior doctor for the NHS, joins us now. Good morning. Do the findings from the YouGov survey surprise you? I'm so sad to say, but not at all. In fact, I remember my first day at work as a junior doctor four years ago, pre-pandemic, by the way. And I was all, I, I couldn't sleep that first week because how stressful the job was on the very first day off work and the first week. So, you know, and after the pandemic, it was a whole different situation altogether. I actually was going through therapy and speaking to my therapist about how um, I've been trying to push money aside, to put money aside to kind of think about how how long I can go without um you know, having to worry about money if I was to quit uh, the NHS. So this doesn't surprise me whatsoever. And I have many colleagues who are considering and actually actively trying to uh, move to Australia and other parts of the world, New Zealand, to to work elsewhere. OK, Basha, really, I, I saw you yesterday in your scrubs. I walked past you, offered you a biscuit. It's very good to see you in the morning <laughs> as well. Um, I, I just... I think what happens in this debate, and I know that you will agree with this, I think that people take up a position. I just want to try and get some common ground, OK? You talk about the stress levels, don't deny that. You talk about the long hours. You talk about how difficult it is for junior doctors. What I want to know is, instead of uh, hearing about people who get trained and then disappear off, how do we... How do we... I saw you yesterday talking to Wes, we'll play that in a minute. How do we make our health service more attractive? Because... You would understand people will go, they only want more money, they keep going on bleeding strike and we can't see a doctor. What do you want? Do you want better services? Do you want more money? Do you want the NHS to care more about its staff? Roy Lilly, an ex-CEO of a trust, was on earlier saying, we need to be thinking about how to retain people, but we need also to use the money more effectively. What's your take on that? Do you know, if I had to say something, then I would say that I wish my first experience as a junior doctor wasn't as traumatic. I don't think money is the answer to every uh, every problem because I remember, you know, working and, you know, being told that half an hour to one hour after I was supposed to finish work, staying over was just normal and I should just accept it. And it was those little, little things that added up to, to having this feeling of, uh, you know, I, I don't like working here. So... Any extra support, whether it's having extra staff or even reducing the burden on junior doctors in terms of all the level of um, admin we have to do, and then on top of that, all the extra exams, all the extra portfolio work, which we all have to do either in our own time or try and slot it in into work hours, I think there's an excessive amount of pressure. And I wish some of that red tape was taken away so that we could actually focus on learning to grow within the job field, feel supported, feel, um, you know, able to voice concerns easily and not, you know, for example, the process of um, escalating sure. if you've stay over at work. It's so long and arduous that uh, Basha, you just... Uh Speaking of expressing concerns, you spoke last night on The Sun's Never Mind the Ballots directly to the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streaking. Streaking. Uh, let's take streaking. a look at that. <laughs> Wes take, Streaking, we hope not. Let's take a look at that clip. Brilliant. You, as a politician, are not connected in any way to the health sector at all. So how do people, the public and the health sector, how can we trust someone who's completely disconnected with the actual health services, never spent a day in a ward, not had to fee face the criticism from patients, from social media, the censorship that we get, um, you know, from GMC and all the rest of it. You don't know what it's like to be in the front lines. Why should we trust someone like you to make the decisions for where we work? Oh, we, oh, we don't know what his answer well, who was. Who that up? <laughs> Bashir, anyway, we, we, never mind. The can fact you, can is, you remember I, what his response yeah, was and where you that, satisfied with it? What you said is absolutely right, isn't it? And it's interesting for me that Labour put itself in there. They must be seriously believing they've got a chance. Tell me, tell me what he said. What, how did he respond? 
he had a very good point that although he's not been in the position of maybe working for the NHS, he has been a patient in the NHS. And, you know, we are a patient uh, centered service after, after all. So uh, absolutely his individual experience as a patient is very much uh, welcome. And, you know, he has he has shadowed um healthcare workers i'm not sure shadowing necessarily represents the stress levels that you feel okay. when the responsibility let's get back to it basha because we could go we could go around in circles i, I really I, I just i want you to try and give me a straight answer i get that it's a patient centered service you would acknowledge would you not that the health center, and i said this earlier right it's revered greatest invention fact is it doesn't work it does work, but it doesn't work. Whether that's staff retention or people being left in corridors, it's still great when you need to go there. But the truth of the matter is we've got an ageing population, a bigger population. It gets 200 billion quid, and even people like Roy Lilly are saying we should spend the money more effectively. What I want from you is how would you make the health service financially and service-wise more appropriate in 2024? Briefly, what would you do? I would definitely use technology to our advantage. I think we really need to push prevention and we need to incentivize good health behavior. I think we have the model in other countries where they rely on insurance policies. And I think we need to encapsulate that and try and incorporate that. So if somebody is uh, quitting smoking or, you know, going to the gym on certain days of the week or eating healthily, I think we should have a point based system where they're able to use that as a uh, model of, OK, look, I'm doing all these health behaviours. I should be able to access my appointment more quickly. I don't know. We should incentivise good health behaviours. Do, uh, do you think the 200 billion quid could be spent more effectively inside the health service? A hundred percent. I think we definitely need to make the systems much better, more efficient. We need to use a centralised system. I really wish that we didn't have to have a different IT system in every new hospital. It wastes so much time for doctors to get used to, and nurses equally, to get used to each system. Waste days of work trying to get used to a new system and IT. I think if we had a centralised system across the whole country where you could just go to a different hospital and just log on and not have to waste time See, on well, learning... Labour, <laughs> Labour have said that they were going to introduce that. I thought it was really interesting. You must know all about the Red Book. We've both just had yes. babies. And not together. unbelievably, the Red Book system, where you have all the baby's details <coughs> and immunisation, is a physical book. And if you lose it, that's that. So it would be fantastic. I like the fact it's a physical book. Well, Labour are, are saying that they will bring in an app-based system and digitise more of the NHS. Carrier Carry pigeons. Well, thank you. We've Basha, run out of time, sadly. You. Dr Bashir Mukherjee, there. Thank you for joining us this morning. What Do you know you what's saying? really interesting? She's a junior doctor. Roy Lilly was an ex-exec and for the first time it's interesting so you've got Labour putting yourself out there we didn't hear what Streeting said but but she basically said to him come on mate both people this morning have said yes there needs to be changes but the money needs to be used more effectively that for me is really interesting that's a doctor a junior doctor and somebody running a trust it's not just about billions more it's about making it work whether that's computerization whether it's about I just think people need to get it off its pedestal and say it ain't working right now. It's busted flush. How do we make it better and not be offended when we have that conversation? You could put a few more quid in, though, couldn't you? No, no. <laughs> and I'm just, I need it for my retirement. Exactly. Sooner rather than later. Well, still to come on talk today. Yes. The Labour Party vows to resolve the oh. local bus Why are they going to do this? Crisis. Buy more buses. Well, when was the last time you went on a bus? I went the other day. I didn't like it because it stopped to let other people on and off. I thought it was just going <laughs> to take me where I was going. And Red teenage Ford. dart sensation Luke Littler is named the prestigious in the prestigious Forbes 30 under 30 list. Under 30 what? Under 30 Stone. years old. Well, uh, writer, writer Emma Wolf and author James Bloodworth take us through the papers next. This is Talk Today. It is 7.25. Good morning. Fancy game of dove. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back to your talk today. It's right on 7.30. We'll have the weather in just a... Minimo Jim Jam. Fantastic. But first, it's coming up on the rest of the programme. And did you know that your phone might be dirtier than your toilet? We'll be looking at that, at that in the papers next. I lick my phone. Not your toilet, though. Uh, cash for gold. That's the message to athletes who are set to get cash prizes for winning gold medals. But how much dosh do you think they'll get for a gold medal? Apparently, well, it's 50 grand, but we're going to tell you it's 7.45. You can't it's... spoil it like that, Jeremy. Right. We're trying to tease people. We're trying to entice them to stay with us, my Why goodness. Why would they stay? It's 50 grand. Switch off. I'm joking. <laughs> well, I'm onto a more serious issue. Mm. Cat calling could land you in serious trouble if you live in Ashfield. So is it right to call it out and face punishment? We'll debate that at 8.45. Is, is, is there any irony in the fact that Ashfield's where Lee Anderson, who left the Labour Party to join the Tory Party, to join the, left the Tory Party to join the Reform Party, lives? I, I don't know. Cat calling, eh? Oi, Nazi! Give us the weather, babe! Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, Didn't if work. we were in Ashfield, I would certainly... I'd be arrested. Wow. Quite. Good morning, Mrs Gaffer. Could you give us the weather, please? That's more like it. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Mr. Kyle. Let's take a look at the weather details for today. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hurrah! Some sunshine, warm conditions for many areas of the UK for today as well. But, of course, not everywhere. But it's a small minority of places that will be rather cloudy, damp and dull and a bit cooler. But everywhere else, lots of sunshine and bright weather. But not for long, because the northwest will see a front come through tomorrow, bringing rain. And uh, further south, we'll see high pressure build for a couple of days. But it doesn't last long, because by the end of the week, we'll see the return of northwesterly winds, cooler conditions, more unsettled weather for the start of the new week as well with widespread showers but a warning free day and a fine start for many largely dry conditions except across southwestern and the southern parts of england there's cloudy skies there from that cold front from overnight with patchy light rain and drizzle and
also areas of mist, fog and sea fog that may actually linger for much of the day across these areas. But apart from that, lots of sunshine in store across Scotland for this afternoon. Just one or two light showers possible out towards the west, but they will be very few and far between. Plenty of sunshine and dry weather for Northern Ireland and Northern England. Perhaps a bit more in the way of cloud across parts of Wales and Midlands, Eastern England. But I still think we'll see bright or sunny spells across these areas. And temperatures likely to locally get up to highs of 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, somewhere around the East Midlands towards East Anglia, seeing those highs. But everywhere, generally above average, even up to 18 in parts of Scotland. But uh, as we head into tonight, we'll see rain return across parts of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Northwest England, heading towards parts of Scotland. Some heavy downpours likely there. So it is going to be a wet night for much of the north and west of the UK. Further south, though, although becoming cloudy, mainly dry. And for everywhere, again, another mild night. Temperatures staying in double figures. So, what's in store for tomorrow? Well, it's more of a northwest southeast divide, so northern or western areas seeing spells of mostly light and patchy rain continuing to spread eastwards across these parts for Scotland, Northern Ireland, the Republic, at times for parts of northern England too. But temperatures still stay above average, 15 to 16 degrees Celsius, and there will be some sunshine for the northeast of Scotland, so still feeling warm there. But most of the bright or sunny spells will be across the majority of England and Wales, where it will be a tiny bit warmer than today and could see the highest temperature of the year so far, up to 22 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Let's go through the papers now with writers Emma Wolf and author James Bloodworth. Emma, I really want to start with this story uh, in The Telegraph. Um, can you just take us through the basics of it? Yeah, so there it was an Afghan sex offender who was uh, deemed to be um, fit for deportation, um, who had his uh, deportation case overturned by lawyers who claimed that because of his sexually disinhibited behavior, I'm quoting them, because of his um, uh, inappropriate behavior towards women, um, if he was returned to Afghanistan, he would be at risk of ill treatment and possibly even mob <laughs> violence. Mm. So God. the tribunal judge ruled that um, he could state that he should be granted refugee status to remain in this country. As part of a protected group. Yeah. What about the women that he attacked in the United Kingdom? They weren't protected, were they? Well, exactly. What about his behaviour here? So he served 12 weeks in prison. Of, I think it was for indecent exposure, is that yeah. right? Yeah. And then he exposed upon, his penis. Yeah. Upon his release, it would expected that he would be deported, mm -hmm. but he's he's kept here because of th that reasoning. Now, one could potentially understand that if he was to be deported to Afghanistan, um, that there would be a danger to other women. Now, I might accept that, that he shouldn't be deported because he needs to be kept here to be monitored because he's a danger to women over there. However, they seem to have What about twist... women over here? Well, no. I understand that. Well, we're... The danger is to himself. The danger yeah. here... Well, f for me... I, I'm just saying I could understand that reasoning more than I can understand that the danger is actually supposedly to himself, James. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it makes no sense to me. It says, you know, the issue is around his mental health. I mean, what's the mental health condition that he's a pervert? Yeah, it's, exactly. I mean, and these... Can we just these... nail... Fantastic. And that's the problem, isn't it? And it, this is what I was trying to say about the transphobia debate. Unless we have these debates because we're too scared to offend somebody. This guy is a sex offender... Yeah. Yeah. Whose lawyers paid by the British taxpayer are going to say you can't go home because you might be a danger to women. Uh, if he's a sex offender, it'll be a sex no, offender. No, no, they're not saying that. Country. They're saying that he's a dan he could be in danger, not because he's a danger to women. I, that a I'm mob, saying yeah. is I, I could understand that because a danger, you know, a danger to women is a danger to women. But, but he's going to be a danger to himself. But once and again, we are responsible for... Yeah. I mean, you're, what you're saying is, yes, there will be... Yes, but we are not responsible for yeah. his behaviour. We are not responsible. Yeah. As you say, millions in yeah. legal aid, but also we are now going to, what, put, put him up here, pay for him here. It just... The and what thing. I don't... What and I don't... the danger that he poses to women here. Because these things And the messages. These things exactly. Escalate. I think this is really important. It starts just one with second, flashing. Jeremy. It starts it, with flashing and then... Exactly. It's so flash. important. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that this individual is going to go on to commit further crimes. Mm. But we know from various previous cases, when cousins, for example, Abdul Azadi. Yes, exactly. Look that, at that man. this the kind of which is which Africa. is why it's so important. Previously, yeah. uh, flashing was considered perhaps a low-level sexual crime. We're going to be talking about catcalling later yeah. on in the show. I think it's really important that we take things like that seriously because, in some cases, it can suggest that men will go on to commit more serious crimes and physical crimes against women. I think this is outrageous. And what I, what I fear is that it's going to turn into a, a debate over, you know, 
seeking asylum, etc. But, but, but this but, but, is really but, but Nick, Nick. No, let me finish. But, At the centre of this is men who are offending against. I completely women. agree, and but it how, will become a let debate. Let me finish my uh, sentence. But, it's a debate about women. Let me finish my sentence. It needs to be about protecting women, not protecting this man or individual. I get, I get that, but you would understand people's frustration, would you not, that an Afghan sex offender... This is, this is red meat for the people who say that our, our migration system, if you want, is, is supported by lawyers who will charge thousands of pounds. That is, that is completely... It undermines it's the system it as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, completely it undermines the whole system, doesn't it? Yeah, but what, what are the police doing to protect women, then? It's... If they're allowing... If they have, a, they have a legitimate reason to protect women in the UK and remove this person, yeah. why on earth is he staying here? This is agree. a wider issue about the deportation system and about the Home Office being completely broken and unfit for purpose because, as we said, Abdullah Zaidi appealed, was turned down twice, appealed mm. again, pretended he was a Christian or said he was a Christian mm. and stayed and look what he did. Yeah. Um, can I bring it to a story that you seem to thought... That I, uh, Nick, you were talking about this. In the eye, the Labour Party has revolt... Revolt? Resolved. Resolved to sort out the bus crisis. How are they going to do what, more buses, more money for the bus drivers? Yeah, so uh, no, I think this Driverless is... Driverless buses. I what? think this is, a, this is a good idea. It's, it's bringing some of the buses back into public ownership and trying to run the bus service like the bus services run in London, where London actually has a really good bus service. Yep. And the issue with private companies running bus services is in the countryside, in rural areas, you can't make a profit Why for it. Why don't we use some of the money you can't from make HS2 a profit for it. It, has to be, it has to be subsidised to some extent. Yeah. And I think that's fine because it's a public service. If it means that older people can get to the shops, they have a public service there. I don't mind that, that, that we all kind of chip in and pay for that because I think it is a valuable public service. It's not about making profit. It's about getting people from A to B wherever they live in, in the country. So I think this is a good idea. Absolutely. No, no, I think we have shocking sort of general public transport around this country. The buses in London Especially are great, London. but the problem is that the traffic is so appalling because of Sadiq Khan's crazy schemes that buses basically just sit in traffic. Couldn't the money from HS2 go to help these more, be more Absolutely. effective yeah. But also, the if we're country, serious... The north, you know, where, where Hang on, are. is it... And if we're serious about car use well, and mate. becoming greener, we need to provide local people with local bus services, trains, yeah. to be able to get it's, away. It's got so bad back in Somerset the bus the bus services, and and it, it does mean it Did does you hurt say you. Somerset. Yeah, back. Can in I just Somerset. make a warning? If you do go to Somerset, you see grass in the middle of the road. It's not necessarily a dual carriageway. It's for the cows to graze off. Oh really? Yeah. I don't um, know that. We're getting uh, to five apparently. Are we, yes. Emma? Filthy smartphones <laughs> are up to six times <laughs> dirtier than toilet seats. This is absolutely vile. It's, a, it's in the I star, but phone. it's actually... It's a point. They have Why a point. Smartphones, mate? Well, how often do you clean your toilet? Or does someone clean... How often do you pay for someone to clean your toilet? Right, here's what you... Right, this is what you're going to How many times know. do you clean your phone? I lick my phone, for God's sake, and, that, and I'm being completely serious. Why? I, I don't know, because I don't like bits in it. That's the OCD. Um, toilet, I've got the, those things. What? Uh, what a toilet? Um... Cleaning ladies. Oh, that's what no, I mean, no, I've got those wipes. Or men. Because obviously boys pee everywhere, don't they? To be honest, you have yeah, to the permanently there. But no, it's true. But why a smartphone, not an iPhone? Why only a smartphone? No, no, phones. Because all phones, phones are available. Phones are absolutely okay. filthy. People are using them all the time. They're often also, additionally, using them in the lavatories. But as you say, Nicola, many people aren't cleaning their phones at all. Eating. You remember that that thing about your workspace was filthier than yeah. la lavatory. And your keyboard is far filthier than a lavatory because of food and bits of skin and bits of hair and bits of human cells and all of that. Mm. Phones are absolutely filthy. And people are using them all the time, holding them up to their face, getting the microgerms, <sighs> the bio... Sorry, I'm not a scientist. They're getting all the micro bio... Do you clean yours, then? Do you all clean yours? But no, give it a wipe, I, give I, it a wipe. I'm going to. As as yeah, we night, must. This, this I want concerning. to clean it now. A wet wipe, Nick. Because you would go to the toilet, wash your hands, then pick up your phone, which, oh, gosh, yeah. yeah just I, like, I wash my hands after being on the tube or something, but then I touch my phone oh, and I'm not washing look. my phone. Yeah. yeah. Look, look at, look at the line. I don't want to look at it's what's on your phone if you've there been you licking go. it, Jeremy Kyle. Thank you so much, Emma yeah. and James. Quite a bizarre papers there, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. Uh, they will be back in just under an hour. Um, you can't keep a straight face, you do it. <laughs> how about I'm iPads? licking my phone? I'm just thinking about how dirty this iPad is now. Well, you've been getting yes. in touch with your views and opinions 
all morning. What do you want to talk about, Jeremy? West Streeting weighs into the gender error, calling the NHS yeah. treatment scandalous. Is he right to support the cast review? This came out yesterday. Well, but, Sophia says yeah. the NHS has made itself a laughing stock by letting down the children who were really, really vulnerable. In the first place, how have they allowed unproven treatments for kids as young as 15 who will take responsibility for the damage already caused? Good morning to Miriam. Human biology, there are a few people who understand it, some who don't, and the rest who refuse to acknowledge it. Amidst all of this, there are drug companies that are not only experimenting on our children's bodies, but are also making huge profits off of vulnerable children and their misery. Isabel says, whoever's responsible for putting these kids through this trauma should hang their heads in shame. The government, the NHS, major drug companies and the parents, everyone. My heart goes out to the children who are left to be abused because of our collective failure. Um, how can we allow experimental drugs and ignorance towards gender care for so long. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 87222. Start your message with the word talk. Uh, don't lick your phone. Moving on now. And a recent survey carried out by the global insight driven research company Census Wide. What does that mean? Uh, found out that a fifth of young people use social media and websites to learn more about relationships and sex. Not well, just young people, by the way. Well, the findings come after the government's announced a review of its statutory relationship, sex and health education guidance for schools more than a year ago. Delighted to say joining us now to discuss this in more detail is MP Caroline Noakes, chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. Caroline, good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Um, using online sources surely leaves um, people, young people, does it, is it a good thing? It's always going to happen. Is it dangerous? Is it untrustworthy information? Where are you on this? Well, look, my select committee did a report on this published last month that said very clearly young people need reliable guidance. It's not good enough for them to be turning to the internet. And specifically, and I'm conscious we're discussing this at breakfast time, but too many young people are turning to pornography where there is seldom a condom scene, and we've got soaring levels of diseases like syphilis and gonorrhea at record levels, the highest record since they, they began in 2018, uh, sorry, in 1918. And so look, we've got to help young people understand from trusted sources, be better educated, and, and use reliable information, not just what they find off social media or their friends. Caroline, but Caroline oh, sorry, go, go. sorry, have you gone into detail, uh, further detail, rather than just saying a fifth of children are using the internet? Because, of course, the internet can encompass all sorts of things. It can mm. encompass government advice, NHS advice. Have, have we broken down what areas of the internet are being used for children to access information about sexual health? Well, of course, you're right to say that there are good sources out there, but I would question how many young people are going to gov.uk to look there for information and actually what we want them to be getting is information in person from trusted adults from school nurses our report called for uh, rshe to be taught not just to 16 as it is now but to 18 so those young people that are either in sixth form college or in sixth form in school having the opportunity to continue the conversation we know surveys from organizations like internet matters found that as many as a quarter of young boys thought that Andrew Tate was a positive role model. Uh, even more worryingly, 56% of their fathers did. And what we have to do is make sure that there are the resources there for teachers to get training so that they're confident Caroline, about discussing I, these subjects. Caroline, yeah. can I jump in? And I'm going to... You're a professional politician. I'm a 58-year-old father of six, so you'll probably think he's old-fashioned. What happened... You've talked about the internet, you've talked about school... What happened to parental responsibility? You might all laugh, but I was fishing, age 12, at the river, and he walked down and he walked up and down the towpath and he went, right, it's time to have the discussion. What's wrong with parents being but responsible? Did he What's discuss... wrong with parents talking about the internet? What's wrong with parents taking responsibility? But did he talk about, for example, safe sex? Did he talk about condoms? Yes! He talked about condoms? Yes, and so he, he about... did. Well, that's good. He didn't, he didn't talk got... about syphilis, but he talked about right. condoms, safe sex. He called it the birds and the beasts. I'm being serious, Caroline. Are we expecting as parents too much responsibility on, you know, internet companies or the government or this or that? Why are parents not taking more responsibility? Well, look, Jeremy, you're a much more experienced parent than I am. You've got six kids. I've only got one. And I know how difficult it was for me a relatively articulate and well-informed parent to have that conversation mm, I that with point. my child. And the stark reality is that, of course, we want parents to be involved in the conversation, but not all of us are great at it. And kids want to be able to know that there are other trusted sources. 
having a conversation about sexually transmitted diseases, about sexting, about internet porn. I will never forget my daughter coming out of school and saying to me, do I have to have anal sex? Now, the stark reality is, is that there was not an adequate conversation in her school, clearly, about consent at all. And my answer was, no, you don't have to have any sort of sex that you don't want to. But are we confident that parents are having those conversations? Because quite frank, I'm not. But it's, it, you say, are we? I don't know who we are, but I'm not, I'm not saying that all parents will, but I do think it's... I don't think it's always the place of government. I think parents need to step up. I understand you'll need a safety net if that isn't the case, but I do think it's easy and becomes increasingly easy to say, oh, it's the government's responsibility or it's the, co the council's responsibility. I think if you give birth or you have a child, you should take responsibility for them. My old-fashioned opinion, anyway. Yes, but children are in school to yeah. get an all-round education, aren't they? And I think over the past couple of years, is it not right, Caroline, that issues of this nature regarding relationships and sex education have been so politicised that actually we do need to have a kind of agreement on what a base level of education should be for all children in the UK? Oh, absolutely. And that's why RSHE is now a statutory part of the curriculum. Many of us campaigned for that long and hard before it became so. And it's why some of us want to see it extended. We want to see it continue to 18. We want there to be much more training for teachers. These are hard conversations to have with any child. And we want to make sure that they're high quality so that young people are learning about consent. I think that should be a mandatory part of yeah. RSHE. Um, um, and also better education about pornography. Yeah. We can't leave it like the Wild West who young people are seeing all sorts of acts on the internet that they think they have to do. I saw a survey that was done, I think it was by Internet Matters, that was saying the vast majority of young men thought that their girlfriends wanted them to choke them and young women thought that their boyfriends expected yeah. to choke them. Wow. But the conversation was never having about nobody actually wanted to do it. They just thought that they had to. Yes. That's the prevalence of internet pornography has done that to young people. Yeah. And therefore, we have to have conversations about it. Conversations and consent has to be at the, fo at the focal point of that. Thank you so much. Thanks, I think we've Caroline. Run out of time. Appreciate uh, it. Conservative MP Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women mm -hmm. and Equalities Committee. Well, still uh, to come, Sam Ellard is here time. with the latest sports. <laughs> Yeah, good morning, Jurgen Klopp. He's begging, protesting fans to channel their anger to bring the club glory. Meanwhile, Rory McIlroy has a different tactic as the golf legend plans to bore his way to a score in Las Vegas. And it's cash for gold, not your old rings, but Olympic gold. 128 years of tradition broken. But how much can champions cash in? I'll have the answer. And much more in just a few minutes. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you about it. laughs> yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to You Talk Today. It is 7.52. Now, Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp has called for unity tonight in the face of ongoing protest from fans. Yeah, the manager wants the Red Devils fans to channel their anger into cheering on the team, but what exactly are they angry about? Red Devils, I though, thought the Red Devils, Red Devils were Man United. United. Red right Devils to... will be Manchester United, yeah. Right. So Even I knew that. Who's right? That Thank is, you. that right. is, yeah. yeah. Well done, Nick. Even I knew Rubbish. that. Rubbish. <laughs> Season tickets. We always have this every single season, <laughs> don't we? Where season tickets go up. Uh, count them, count them, count them. Two percent. Count, 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 count. Uh, Liverpool yeah. fans are not happy about. Uh, and what's going to happen tonight at their Europa League game against Atalanta is the cop that would normally look. That's a, a stand behind the goal that will normally look fantastic with flags and banners in kind of a protest and a little bit of a two fingers up to the ownership. There'll be no flags, no banners on the cop today. It's going to look really, really bare, which will be strange. All because 2% increase on season tickets. Should say not the only club I've seen Arsenal up theirs by 6%, Spurs 6%, Man City 5%. Look, look there is, there is, we know there's so much money in football through advertisement, yeah. through, through TV money, yeah. most importantly. You know, 2%, these fans pay enough money as it is. Do they always have to go up most seasons? I agree. Football you... without fans is nothing, Jeremy. I just, I feel I, for the may, fans may, that I, spend I... their lives Could... slaving away to yeah, go to games yeah. on weekends. There's so much money in, in from the TV. Players are on so much money. 2%, someone argues only 2%, but it's 2% this season. What will it be next year in two Completely years' time? Agree, when do we say enough's enough and put a cap on... If you want 50,000 you know, people in your stadium, you need to consider the fans. Europa League tonight, Liverpool at London. Yes, there. at the mighty West oh, of Ham. Course. West Ham have got no chance. Let me tell you about West Ham tonight. How many are you going to lose by, Jeremy? Final. They're up against the team by Leverkusen who haven't lost a game all season. When I said they haven't lost a game, they haven't lost a bleeding game out of 33. We've got two opes, no ope, and Bob yeah. open. Thank God and I'm And, of course, their manager by Leverkusen is Xavi Alonso, who is confirmed that he's staying in the club, who has been wanted by Liverpool, by Bayern Munich. Um, will you lose by four goals or five goals I tonight? think that Manchester... I, I, sorry? I think that West Ham will lose 3-0 tonight. OK, I think take that when you go into the second leg now. That's that's let's, talk, could be worse. let's talk about the Masters, you cheeky Ooh, man. Um, the Masters starts today. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me here, Jeremy. Would you go... Would you say, some would say, the best sporting event of the calendar year? It is an extraordinary <clears throat> spectacle. Nick, I've been lucky golf. enough, okay, to, go. Thank you. Thank lucky you. enough yeah. to go five it's times. Golf. You walk in downtown um, uh, Atlanta, it, it's, it's, you know... Chicken everywhere, and you go through these gates. It's like walking into heaven. You're not like I jogged, and the man went, "There's no running at the Masters. You have to walk. You can't take a phone. You can't take pictures. They haven't got scoreboards. It's like walking into this utopia. Yeah. It's the most extraordinary place to go." And I always feel like with the Masters, so many different stories, so many different players have got different backgrounds, what they're trying to achieve. But I always feel like with the Masters, certainly for us anyway, it's always about Rory McIlroy, isn't it? We know that the Masters is the one major he needs to win to complete the Grand Slam. He's won two U.S. Opens. He's won the Open. Um, a US PGA Championship. His last major, nine years now. Nine years. Yeah. And if you'd have said nine years ago, the Rory McIlroy, I think it was 25 nine years ago. Give you two names well, for the Masters. Go on, it. who are we going it's for? It's brilliant. And you can listen on Talk Sport as well. Tommy Fleet with the English golfer. Could be the first English golfer since Faldo went back to back and then won in 96. And Joaquin Neiman, an Argentinian, top of his game. Um, you can get 50 grand now, apparently, if you win a gold yeah, medal. Yeah, this is interesting. This is, is split. Right? Yeah. I was going to defend whoever wrote the auto cue because actually you misread it and we were talking about the Dutch manager, of course, Eric Ten Hag. Who, there we go. And that is the Red Devils that is Manchester the Red Devils United. Because they, he manages Manchester United. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I just, I just wanted to, you know, 
There in, he is. In the interest of honesty. Yeah, <laughs> we've no. we only got 20 seconds. What are we talking about? Olympic gold medals. Oh, to you guys. Have you got Olympic gold medals? Yes. Yeah, okay, big, big story. Athletics is broken on 128 year tradition by becoming the first sport to offer prize money to gold medalists. And a landmark decision announced by Lord Co yesterday. Each athlete that wins an individual track and field event in Paris this summer will receive just short of £40,000. Split, split a lot of opinion. Some say it's a natural the way the sport's evolving. Mm. Some say, hang on a minute, really? Are you fighting for money in the Olympics? Should it all be about pride and tradition? Well, they've got to be paid somehow, haven't we all? Thank you, Sam Ellard. You. Lots no more. gold medals here. Thanks, Sammy. We'll get him a gold medal. We'll the the bronze, show, You'll get him anything. <laughs> I saw the pictures of him and you and your husband. It was a well, thruple, ladies and gentlemen. Beyonce, no? We are running out of time. Uh, Shadow <laughs> Health Secretary Wes Streeting has branded NHS treatment of kids questioning their gender as scandalous. We'll be discussing that and finding out what else he had to say with a former health secretary next. It's almost three minutes to eight o'clock. So talk today. Please, please come back because we'll still be here. Ta-ra. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. you it, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to have was moved another on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you, my friends. It's gone 8 o'clock. It's Thursday, the 11th of April already. It is indeed. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories this morning. Developments overnight in Bradford as 25-year-old Habiba Masu is charged with murdering a mother who was stabbed while she pushed her baby in a pram. 
A trans treatment row ignites in the Labour Party after the Shadow Health Secretary West Streeting throws his support behind the CAS review. And calling out the cat callers as Ashfield Council reveals plans to find people who make rude or unwelcome comments. We'll ask about the benefits and the drawbacks of enforcing such a ban. And hooray! Warm conditions and sunshine for most places, not everywhere. I'll have the details in the forecast a little later. What did she turn into? A comedian? Hooray! <laughs> That's good. We have to take the good news whilst we can, especially yeah, when it comes true. to the weather. Right, thank you so much, Naz. Thanks, Naz. And now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masoom, who's 25, is due to appear at Bradford Magistrates Court this morning. He's also charged with possession of a knife. We'll be live in Bradford in just a moment. A woman who died following a stabbing in London has been named as detectives continue to appeal for information. The body of 27-year-old Kamo Nan Thiam Fanit was found on Monday in Westminster after her friends contacted police concerned about her welfare. She was known to friends as Angela and neighbours reportedly heard two high-pitched screams hours before her body was found. The U.S. president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said that the U.S.'s commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. The Metropolitan Police will reinvestigate why it charged TV presenter Caroline Flagg due to possible new evidence. The TV star was facing prosecution for assaulting her boyfriend when she took her own life in 2020. A coroner ruling said she feared the publicity a trial would attract. The CPS had said Caroline should only get a caution, but the Met appealed it and she was charged. Flagg's mother has repeatedly criticised how police handled the case. And police officers in Oxfordshire say they've been left confused by a copycat, which turned out to be a bird. Take a listen. Said at first they thought their cars had developed a fault, but after some investigating, it turned out to just be a vocal starling, a bird known for its ability to mimic. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour's time. Thanks, Em. As ever, throughout the show today, can you please uh, be involved? You can do it via text, of course, 8722. Start your message with the word talk. You can also email the show, talk today at talk.tv. Text, as we've said, uh, we're talking about that uh, that change, that gender row, Labour's West Streeting. We'll be talking about that in just a tick. He's changed stance. What are your thoughts on that? We'll also be talking about cat calling as well. But I want to start again this hour by going back to that main news story in Bradford, where a 25-year-old man has been charged over the murder of a mother who was stabbed to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. Well, Habiba Masoom from Burnley will appear in court later after he was arrested during a four-day manhunt following the killing of 27-year-old Kulsuma actor on Saturday. Our correspondent Nick Ellaby is live from Bradford with the very latest. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Nicola. The facts of this case we know so far, as you say, Habiba Masoom, who was 25 and known to be a resident of Burnley, he will appear later this morning at Bradford Magistrates Court behind me He's been charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. And it follows the death of Kulsuma Akta, who was 27. She was stabbed to death in broad daylight here in Bradford, in the centre of Bradford on Saturday afternoon. A very busy intersection, just a mile or so to the north of here, at Westgate on the corner of Druton Road. And uh, she was taken to hospital, but later sadly died of her injuries. Her cousin had described her as loving, caring, humble, and also having the gift to make people laugh. And it's reported her mother, who's living in Bangladesh, is just constantly crying. Now, Habib Masum was arrested on Tuesday, 150 miles to the south of here, in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. That was following a four-day manhunt. Police raided properties in Burnley, in Oldham, and in Chester. And they've also arrested four other men uh, being held currently in question in connection with this case. They're being questioned on suspicion of assisting an offender and also on drugs charges as well. And then a fifth man has also been arrested and bailed in connection with this case. He was arrested in Chester. Now, the West Yorkshire Police 
have referred themselves to the police watchdog. That's the IOPC, the Independent Office for Police Conduct. And it's because they had contact with the victim, 27-year-old Miss Acta, before she was killed on Saturday. Uh, but that headline again, Habiba Masum, 25 years old, a known resident of Burnley, will appear today here at Bradford Magistrates Court, charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. Well, thank you so much to Nick Ellaby in Bradford there. Terrible, terrible story. We'll keep you updated. And as I said, please, and what are your opinions on that as well? I mean, we have to be really careful because it's a legal Of course, because there's, yeah, the charges have been made. So it's, yeah, we are restricted in what we can say about it. But what we can say is that it's obviously an extremely tragic case. And they have referred themselves to the police watchdog and the lady the had contact have, yeah. with them before. So you can make of that what you will. Mm. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 87 trouble two on to other news. Shadow Hill, Sage Tree, West Streeting. Uh, yesterday branded the NHS's treatment of kids questioning their gender as scandalous. Well, speaking on Nevermind the Ballots here on Talk TV, Mr. Street was asked whether his position on trans issues had changed as his party battles with their definition of a man and a woman. Let's take a look. They ran a campaign saying trans women are trans, trans women are women, get over it. Do you agree with that? Mm, uh, no, it's to the extent that, that, and I say this with some self-criticism and reflection, if you'd asked me a few years ago uh, on this topic, I would have said Trans men are men, trans women are women, some people are trans, get over it, let's move on. This is, this is all blown out of proportion. And now I sort of is sit and reflect and think, actually, there are lots of complexities Isn't that and the problem, that leading today. figures like yourself, and I'm not just singling you out, but leading figures like yourself were saying, get over it, no, when people, were trying, to, like, when people right. were trying to raise the facts. Do you regret it? No, I, I absolutely take the criticism on the chin. Well, we're joined now by political commentator Matthew Stallen and The Spectator's James Heal. Matthew, I'm going to start with you. Um, we're streeting there, kind of backpedalling on previous comments he's made surrounding the trans so-called debate. But at the end of the day, it's true, is it not, that somebody who has legally transitioned is legally defined as a woman if they've transitioned from male to female? Correct. I think there are different strands to this whole thing. And we know that toxicity is a massive player in this, and that was punched out in the CAS report to the extent that toxicity has impacted the availability and quality of evidence for the care of children. So when we're talking about children, children have to be absolutely front and centre and they should not be the victims of the culture wars on either side. And there's horrible, horrible stuff coming from both sides. As far as is a trans woman a trans woman? Yes, a trans woman is, is a woman or she's a, a trans woman. She's, she, she was born biologically male, she's still biologically male, but she sees herself and is legally defined as a woman. Mm -hmm. And certainly I would not call a trans woman a man, because I think it's offensive. Do I think that should be illegal? Probably not. Should people be able to describe biology, bio, biological reality, as it is? Yes, they should. But can we take the toxicity out of it? Can we take the personal abuse out of it? Because children, particularly, but also adults and their well-being have to be front and centre. And Isn't... this was a finding of the CAS report, yeah. wasn't it, um, James, that, you know, at the centre of this are very... Whichever side you, you fall on, very vulnerable children mm. who are reaching out to health services because they want help. Absolutely, and I think what comes out of the cash report, a product of you know, four years of work, 388 pages, is really, I think, perhaps the sense of the NHS services, identity services, being, to an extent, overwhelmed because of this has been such a huge trend over the past 10 years. I think the Tavistock Clinic, for one example, had about uh, 500 referrals, to, sorry, 250 referrals in 2011, but more than 5,000 referrals by 2021. So that's a factor fold of 20 over mm. the past 10 well, years Well, I said so. it yesterday and it wasn't very popular, although actually a couple of people agreed. I absolutely agree with you. Right, I do think that the that the children angle is massively, massively important. I believe that we should be spending our time, which is what the CAS report says, not doling out puberty blockers. We should spend time psychologically talking and counselling to these kids. But there was a it was a comment from one of our one of our contributors yesterday, which is it's fashionable, and that is a concern. And people might not like this, but you talk about this this tenfold increase, and you wonder whether there are youngsters who are acting like sheep. And that is why it is frightening, and that is why there should be controls in place. It's not about disrespect respecting what people want to be or what they are. It's about saying, these are kids. And I absolutely... That is such a relevant well, point. I, I think my, I've said all along through this debate that experts should be in charge. The problem is 
that there might not be very good evidence one way or another. Mm. I mean, my instinct is, and this is so personal to me, and every single person watching or listening today will have their own view. My instinct is that children shouldn't be making any sort of irreversible changes to their bodies. But I have to have humility, because what do I know? Mm. I mean, I'm a, I'm a young dad, my child is 18 months, I don't have experience of children now. I, I grew up in a time when there was no one trans, or almost no one, almost no one trans. So I have to have humility, and I think we could all do with a bit of humility. Yeah, and my Jane. point was on this is the, is the relative novelty of this, which is that we don't know yet the longer term effects of this. Mm. When you get places like the, the, the Kira Bell mm. case, for instance, where someone regrets a decision they made and said it was done on insufficient evidence. And that was one of the thing, takeaways from this report, which is that actually puberty blocks, for instance, have been referred to without seeing the long term effects of that in clinical trials. And the question is, why are we upscaling that as a rolling out it, elsewhere? It's not the issue. The evidence? It's it's not the issue, as we seem to find with so many discussions. We were talking about this yesterday. The great thing about the Castro report is that we're having this debate. We're having it in a in a in a in a balanced way because you know it, you not can't have these debates because yeah. you're transphobic or you kind of. The, the fact of the matter is. You just said it. There were no trans people. So, so it, there, so were there, there, there were trans people. There were trans people. They weren't. There, there weren't. That I didn't know any trans right. people growing okay. up, and also there were what? far fewer people identifying as trans. Does that mean there weren't no. any genuinely trans people? No, I don't think it does. I think that there were many things going on 40 years ago when I was a kid that are going on now and abhorrent. But you didn't have social media. You didn't know about it. I've said that for a long time. What I'm saying is, I think we as a society shouldn't be scared of having this debate. I think you're absolutely right about kids, but I think we should be spending time and resources resources and counselling on making sure this monumental decision is right. But the problem is, if you say that in the past, you're, oh, you're against somebody changing. I don't believe, and I don't care if I get thrown out this studio, at 13 or 14, you know mm. genuinely whether you should be able to change. I don't think you're ready for this. Well, so as, I've, as, really I've, as I've already said, Jeremy, my instinct is that children should not be able to do irreversible things yeah. to their bodies. Completely. But that's my instinct. And yeah. I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not an expert. But the other thing is, I may be wrong. You know, I may be wrong, and if you are trans, I'm going to use this word carefully, but if you are genuinely trans as a child and you go on to live a life as a trans man or as a trans woman, you can imagine how painful it must be as a child not being allowed to change your mm -hmm. your, your your physicality to represent mm -hmm. who you to, to show who you think you are. I think, Difficult. I think the key thing here is that you know they may be right, they may be wrong, but the key point is having those safeguards in place to ensure yes. that any decisions are made, long-term decisions which can affect Completely. their bodies forever, on the basis of evidence, and that's what we need Base to. Basis of evidence and the best interests of the child. Absolutely. We're going to move Gotta on now to this, a Nick. slightly lighter topic. <laughs> Thank there God. has been a poll that yes. suggests that only 13% of Brits trust Rishi Sunak to put mm. up a shelf, compared to 47% who choose Keir Starmer. There's lots of other um, examples Apparently here. Apparently, Starmer's better to have a chat in the pub. Well, that's the key one, Jeremy and Nicola. That is the key one. Which one? Who would, the, you... the, the, who would you... Who would be better to have a chat with in the pub? And mm. Starmer wins this, I think, overwhelmingly. And Sunak can get you a discount at the shop. It's because he's got a billion quid and doesn't give a damn, probably. <laughs> James, who, who would you prefer to put up a shelf in well, your Well, clearly, son of a toolmaker, Keir Starmer, <laughs> is resonating I, with the British public. I think, I think that, that might be it. Tools, I think. Oh <laughs> if we're talking about, if, guys, if we're talking about connectivity between the electorate and our politicians, then it sort of matters on some level or is seen to matter whether you could sit down with a pint. That was what was part of the appeal of Nigel yeah, you're Farage. Making, you're, making, you're making this ser serious, but there is a point here. I, they are both as boring as each other, are they not? I, they suspect, not. I suspect in private they're both quite good conversation. What? I suspect in private they're both quite good really? conversation. Really? You're in a very nice I, I look, like yesterday, last e yesterday evening, I was on stage with a former Prime Minister, Theresa May, and I criticised her a lot when she was Prime Minister. Was she good company? Yes, she was. Look, when it comes Theresa to May. putting up a shelf, we <laughs> yes. know that you would need a hammer and a nail in which to do that. And it's not oh, the no. first time that Rishi Sunak's been seen holding a hammer. Let's take a look. Yeah, but this is fake news, Nicola. What's so this doing? is Rishi Sunak, who was... He was been told videoed. to do it that way, Nicola. He was videoed Are hammering... Are unfair? Hammering was... a nail. Let me finish. Well, he he, was, so, he, just, he faced a lot of criticism for using the side of a nail. He was criticised for not knowing how to use a hammer It went properly, viral. And it went viral. But, but... in his defence, he was told by the lady that was uh, accompanying Maybe him there... Maybe the public have bought the fake news. I don't exactly, think the other, the other, that he should use The, the other fun ways. takeaway from this was that uh, more people would trust Rishi Sunak to leave him out of an escape room. I thought maybe it's probably easier than leading the Tory party. But, I uh, think so. Aren't, aren't we? Yeah. We're in a, a nationwide escape room at the moment, it feels <laughs> like, doesn't it, James? But is he the man it's to lead about though, it? We were saying earlier about how, you know, after all the chaos of the last few years, suddenly these two politicians, these two leaders, 
are the sort of bank manager yeah. dower straight and you know Labour is trying desperately to prove that they are right on everything but you look at Sunak he talked I mean I said this this morning he talked about I'm going to do this differently after the chaos the Tory party is in a worse position than it was under Liz Truss right now me, which tells you everything let me just quickly say one thing on that because we, we're often on here talking about the polls and how devastating they are for the Tories and yeah. they are and I think Labour will win quite convincingly but Theresa May last night when I asked her about this she said remember what happened in 2017 when she called that disastrous snap election mm -hmm. to try and increase a majority right up until about the last week it looked like the Tories would win convincingly and they lost their majority so things can go different ways we, you, we have to take the, the I do, I do the think, picture I do salt. think there is a difference between now and 2017 and I and I think that I don't know if it's 14 years I don't know whether it's just an apathy about I think they just. 14 is I, a I desire think, for change. I think it's a bit. It's a bit like the Manchester United players are saying Ten Hag looks like he knows he's a busted flush at Man United. The Tory party, to me, look like they know the writing's on the wall. And it doesn't so. seem I, to be well, much. Look at the number of people who are leaving. I think the fact that the polls have shifted so little since the last May, May elections suggests to me that people have actually got news avoidance. They're kind of tuned out, they've made their judgment, nothing much is changing it, the budget didn't affect them, the fiscal statement in the autumn didn't. So I think they're waiting to cast their judgment until the short campaign. I don't think anything will change, really. Do you think it's natural that after 14 years, this is kind of the cycle of politics? Mm. Yes. It was inevitable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you cycle through your talent, uh, people trust you less. And this is the thing Rishi Sinek can promise the world right now, people won't believe it. That's the key thing. It's about credibility. It's and about course, stopping listening. Yeah, and of course, and, every, and also the true party's changed. So the government of 2010 was very different from to now. So people will say, why are you running up against the challenges you set yourself? Things like the European Union, for instance. Well, that was all the policies of 10 years ago. So the whole party's changed. So that makes it much more difficult for the government. But, but it's very interesting, isn't it? You, you just said something there about he, he could almost do anything and nothing will change. I think people... I think you're right. I think they've made their minds yeah. up. And this is why there's a clamour for an election. But I will say, and I shall watch Stadlin's face and, and Corporal Thorpe's, oh. I don't believe for any minute of my life that in 12 months time we will be any better off and I feel the reality of where we're at as a country both in terms of the world and now is not going to get any better that's why I I watched the Labour Party you know Rachel Reeve saying there isn't any money which is a massive change for them we are in a bad position and I think that and I think it's going to rain is... down on Starmer instead of Sunak in a few months as time. we've discussed before you know quite big figures like Sir Vince Cable who was leader of the Lib Dems like Andrew Marr is a respected political commentator and presenter they have said I think you know, what happens in two years' time when Starmer isn't able to change things, when he fails mm -hmm. to deliver because times are so tough? What happens then? Is there a lurch to, mm -hmm. to the right? I think the cyclical point here is key because I'm not sure there is a vast enthusiasm for Labour, but first 18 years of my life, Tory, 14, the next 14 years, Labour, or 13 years, now 14 years of Tories. Our system goes like that. How old are you? Very old, 44. <laughs> right, well, unfortunately, we have run out of time with Matthew Sutherland. Thank you, gang. Spectators, you. James Heal, thank you both. Now, new analysis out today reveals a shocking number of staff looking to leave the NHS. The figures show that almost half of NHS workers have looked for jobs outside the service, and 29% have actively inquired about non-NHS work. Last year, the health service launched its first long-term workforce plan with a view to retaining current staff and boosting numbers, but stress... Workload and staff shortages are the top three reasons as to why workers say they are going to leave the service. We're joined now by former Health Secretary Stephen Dorrell. Uh, Stephen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we, we, I, I just want to start. You're an ex-Health Secretary, uh, and I keep saying it to the point where I'm boring myself. This NHS for years has been revered. It's the great NHS. Yes, but it ain't fit for purpose, Mr Dorrell, is it? We've got an ageing population, a bigger population. It's not just about money, it's about efficiency. But to me, yes, it's great, but we need to criticise it because it's not working, is it? I wholeheartedly agree with you that uh, if you're committed to the principles of the health service and all the evidence is that the electorate embrace the principle that health care should be available to those who need it at the time that they need it without uh, regard to their ability to pay. That principle everybody embraces. The question then is how well do we deliver it and could we deliver it better? And the answer to the first question is not as well as we could. So the answer to the second question is that we should be changing it in order to deliver the, the objectives better. What changes need to be brought in then, Stephen? Obviously, you were former health secretary. It's a very different situation that we're in now. But using your experience, what would you change if you were in power tomorrow? Well, it, the, the answer is uh, you, usually here, 
it's not actually single stroke of the pen decisions by the health secretary. It's a whole mass of detailed changes. Um, Wes Streeting, the Labour uh, health spokesman, has been talking about this, about the need to engage uh, new forces. People bring new ideas into the delivery of GP services, bringing new ideas into which patients should be seen in hospital, which ones can be seen using technology in different ways in community services. Importantly, don't think about the health service as something separate from social care, and certainly don't think about hospitals as separate from GP services. This is one set of services that need to work better together, to join them up rather than thinking about them as discrete silos. That's something that uh, ministers have talked about forever. I talked about it when I was a minister. Others have talked about it. Uh, we need to be much better at joining up the different bits of the service. Stephen, when you... I remember speaking to a politician who will remain anonymous many, many years ago, and them saying that you go into politics and you have this great belief, and then you get into the machinations of government mm. or what, Westminster, and it's difficult. Let's take Nicola's point a stage further, because it was a great one. Secretary of State for Health, you know, we have this debate so often. We see junior doctors striking, because they shouldn't be doing 100 hours a week. We see nurses who accepted 5%, but, you know, say quite rightly, I think, this is vocational, but we feel that we're not supported. And you answer... You say to them, is it about hours and money? Is it about services? We have the debate about £200 billion and still it doesn't work. Let's put this in layman's terms. What would you do? Would you start again? Do you? Is it just money? It, what, how would you make it? Because, and I genuinely mean this, Stephen Dorr, I think it's one of the greatest inventions in the modern world, but it is fast becoming, I'm afraid, something that we should criticise and we shouldn't feel bad about criticising something that isn't doing what it should be doing. Well, you started off by asking me, should we criticise? And of course, the answer to that is yes, nothing is above criticism. And certainly, no none of our institutions should be above criticism. But equally, we need to be careful about sweeping statements saying it doesn't work. There are too many occasions when it doesn't work for individuals. But there are many, many other occasions when for individuals it does work. Uh, take, for example, the, the uh, issue you introduced this subject on, which is uh, the ability of the health service uh, to not just to recruit staff, but to keep them engaged and motivated and give them fulfilling careers. In some parts of the health service, uh, you have very low staff turnover, very high levels of staff commitment, and people s speak very highly of the working environment in, one, in some hospitals. But you can say, have other hospitals down the road where that isn't the case. Now, looking, looking at an organisation or a set of organisations more accurately that employ one and a half million people, there are some parts of it that are very good and there are some parts of it that aren't as good as they should be. All right, so and very we, quickly, we very quickly, how would you make yeah. the bits that aren't good, very briefly, better? If you were doing that job now, how would you make it better? So the answer is avoid the risk, uh, avoid the danger of over-centralisation empower local communities to deliver better joined up services, GP services, social care and hospitals, all working together within the local community. That's better than a single national solution. Well, thank you so much, Brilliant, former Stephen. Health Secretary Stephen Durrell for joining us this morning, thank you. Well, still to come on Talk Today, thousands of fake stamps are entering Britain from China. Really? And do you double dip your tea bags? <laughs> well, you're not the only one. It double, double well. We'll explain it in five minutes. Writer Emma Wolf and author James Budworth will be back to take us through the papers next. Stay with us. It is 8.24. Do Good you morning. dick twice? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman, 
is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just... 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back I don't to quite know to... what to say. I'm stressed. Why are you stressed, Jeremy? Tea bags. We're going to be talking about tea bags later on in the show. And Jeremy Carl's just Googled something that he never should have done. It is 8.28. We'll have the weather with Naz in just I'm a moment. I'm traumatised. As we both are. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. <sighs> I can't read it. Is it ever OK to reuse or double dunk? I can't do this. Your tea bag, tea baggy, tea bag! We'll discuss that in the papers next. Meanwhile, catcalling could land you in serious trouble if you live in Ashfield. So is it right to call it out and face punishment? We'll debate that before nine o'clock. And um, what does that say? And move over cronuts? It's all about... I've gone from tea bags to cronuts. It's all about the crookie. We'll be telling you about the latest food craze and sample some ourselves just after 9.15. I'm so excited about that. Naz. Please save me. What's the weather looking like? Do you like it milky? I reckon you do. <laughs> With two sugars. I don't know what to say. I don't think people out there know what we're talking about, do they? Because I'm 58. I didn't know what that thing meant where you dip. I didn't. <laughs> Dreadful. I'm just going to leave you to brew on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Good weather for seagulls. Lovely uh, smells of sunshine out there today. And it's going to be feeling warm as well. <laughs> Um, not everywhere, though. Across southern areas of the UK, it's looking quite cloudy with a cold front lingering there with some patchy light rain and drizzle. And then we return to unsettled conditions across the northwest of the UK, but high pressure builds across the south. So fine and dry across southern areas for a couple of days before we return back to the unsettled conditions through the weekend, especially on Sunday. It will turn cooler with blustery showers pretty much everywhere. So this morning, hooray, a warning free day, mostly fine and dry out there this morning, except across southern and western areas of the UK. That's where we're seeing 
seeing cloudier skies, some patchy light rain and drizzle. Also quite murky around coastal parts in particular. There will be some sea fog that may linger for much of the day. But as you can see, this afternoon, a vast improvement compared to yesterday in the last few days for Scotland. Mainly dry with lots of sunshine, perhaps a tad cloudy in the northeast. Also feeling mild. Plenty of sunshine for Northern Ireland and the northern half of the Republic and bright or sunny spells for most of England and Wales, except along the south coast. I think it's going to be quite a dull and damp day there. Uh, but it will be feeling warm in the sunshine, especially around parts of East Anglia and the East Midlands, where we could see temperatures up to 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, above average everywhere, though. Now, into tonight, we'll see more rain piling in across Ireland and Northern Ireland, eventually to Scotland and the north and west of England and Wales, but further south and east stays mostly fine and dry. And again, it is going to be another mild night. Temperatures remaining in double figures quite widely, perhaps a tad blustery overnight, but the wind's from the southwest, so staying mild. And then tomorrow, it's more of a northwest southeast divide. So, northern and western areas continuing patchy outbreaks of rain spreading northeastwards. Still a bit of sunshine, though, and dry weather for the northeast of Scotland. But for England and Wales, generally looking fine and bright and a bit warmer as well. So, a closer look at the mid afternoon picture across Scotland. Rain across the west, the northeast, bright or sunny spells. For Northern Ireland, I think we'll see a bit of brightness at times but more in the way of sunshine for central and southern parts of England and Wales where locally temperatures get up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Well, it's time to go through the papers now with writer Emma Wolf and author James hold on, Bloodworth. Hold on, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm really shocked about this. Yes, what are you shocked well, about? Well, the editor of this show has sent me something. I'm not keeping it to myself at all. If you're going to send me gratuitously rude things while I'm trying to keep a straight face, she's made something out of seagulls now. It's just getting worse. Wow, what can you see? The problem with the internet? Exactly. Now I said seagulls. She goes on... I, honestly, I'm a boring man, me. Well, Emma, we're going to start with uh, The Mirror, a story here about pensioners' food poverty oh, skyrocketing. Her. Yeah. Despite the fact that pensions did go up under the triple lock, more and more pensioners are really struggling with, with high, with high uh, food costs, but also with their bills, with all the energy costs. So the number of pensioners struggling to afford enough food has gone up from 160,000 in 2021 to over 350,000 this year. So uh, Labour, the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, is blaming 14 years of devastating Tory economic failure um, Age UK is saying that, you know, a lot of older folk are just struggling to pay for food. Um, and there's this sort of piece um, in the mirror, uh, you know, a lady, an 81-year-old, uh, Sheila Coral, who says the amount, she has to halve the amount of food that she buys and that, you know, the pension you know, you know, rise is you, about £18 a week and she simply can't live on that. You know, I, I know we mess around, but for me, veterans and people who have lived all their lives and worked hard yeah, paid into are the system. an absolute <laughs> must of who we should look after. I want you to explain something to me, actually, because I was talking to my father-in-law about this yesterday and I have no idea. Triple lock mm. means that pensioners are guaranteed an increase. Can you explain this? Because I... That I, goes there are up in line either. with inflation, inflation or... What are the two but other... But it was average wages. CPR. Inflation or average, average wages... Um, at all consumer price index. Yeah, so whichever yeah. of those three is the highest, highest. I believe, then I, 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 that's why it's gone up 8.5%. I remember saying to my parents before they both uh, passed that, that you know, I, I think in this country we should do a lot more for older people, as families, actually. Yes. And you look across the world, they take the older person in and, and, and that's how it works. But then the reality is very different. <clears throat> but you're not, you don't just look at the food. You think about how these people then can't afford to go into a home and they lose Eating everything they've homes. worked for. I, I, do, I yeah. honestly, genuinely, hand on heart, think we should do more for the older generation. I, really Can, I agree with that. Can we link that to the, the story that you've got as well, Emma, in the mail? Olive oil sales <gasps> This are is a sh soaring. Really? This is a shocker. A litre bottle. Someone was tweeting yesterday pictures of just a regular supermarket shelf with prices. I hadn't realised a litre bottle at Tesco of olive oil costs £13.85. In Spain, Olive oil prices have risen so much that supermarkets are padlocking olive oil to the shelves. They're padlocking their big five-litre yeah. canisters to the shelves. It really is. It's to do with... Well, obviously, it's to do with um, heat waves and water shortages and floods and the kind of general climate instability around the, around the world. But, yeah, absolutely massive. And sales have... Uh, pr sorry, prices have quadrupled in the past four years, so... Incredible. You know, no wonder it's so difficult for pensioners to make that... 
right. pay packet I hate it. last. I it's hate absolutely it. awful. I think it's, I think it's so wrong. I think uh, we should do more. For James, that. take us through this story. This is fascinating. Front page of the Mail. China is flooding Britain with fake stamps. Tell us why. Not just fake stamps, it seems. <clears throat> yeah. So I mean, there's there's this glut of um, victims having to pay penalties for. So you know, if you if you if you put a, don't put enough stamps on something, mm -hmm. then the person who receives it has to then then pay a fine basically. Yes. Yeah. The, so this is what's happening because people are finding that their mails arriving with fake stamps on. Um, buying them from China, because you can buy... You're not obliged if you're a small retailer. You don't have to buy the stamps directly from Royal Mail. You can buy them anywhere. Um, so you've got people buying them wholesale from places like Amazon. Wholesale? But, yeah, so, so, I mean, wow. the thing is, I think you could just change the laws and, and oblige people to buy them from straight from... direct from Royal Mail, because they make them in an official place in Birmingham where it's... You can't... It can't be counterfeited there. Um, I, I just think that would be an easy way to solve the problem. You shouldn't just be able to buy them off the shelf from elsewhere, from China. You should just yeah. have to get them direct from the supplier. In well, the old days... It like that hard to solve I used this. to send a carrier pigeon. In the old days, if it wasn't pranked, you could... Yes, I right. remember Mum and Dad used to... And then they weren't mean, but they used to... You, you'd pull off the bit off yeah, the, the stamp it. on and you'd pop it in a, in a little bowl of warm water and the, the stamp would float off and you'd reuse it because yeah. it they, hadn't been pranked. Now they've got barcodes, though, um, so, so they can just be scanned and this is how they detect the fake ones. You don't have they? to lick them anymore, do you? I no, don't think so, right, no. Right, I think right. they're self-adhesive. But that is fascinating. Uh, James, another story <clears> now. <sighs> Tell us why Brits are hanging their tea bags on the washing line so they can reuse them. I mean, I mean again, it it's goes back to the kind of cost of living uh, crisis thing. So, I mean, my grandmother not, didn't used to hang them on the washing line, but used to put them in a cup and then reuse them. Wow. Um, she was just kind of thrifty from being bought up during the, during the Second World War. It was like a habitual thing. But it, it does go to show, I mean, we looked at pensioner poverty. Pensioners have had an 8.5, not to diminish pensioner poverty, but they've had an 8.5% rise in their pension. Yeah. If you look at people who haven't had that rise in their wages, it's, it's even tougher at the moment. It shows how, how difficult things are, that people are having to, you know, tea, how much does a tea bag cost? A, a couple of pence, yeah. uh, a tea bag. They're, they're having to hang them out on their washing line to reuse them because people are short of money. Emma? Things are bad out there. I don't drink tea, but yeah, that sounds... I do remember my nana doing exactly the same, sort of putting Thrifty. the tea bag aside and then you give it an extra squeeze and swoosh it around and things. But I mean, this is the thing. These are the things that older people especially are affected by. Because they're at home all day, they need to be warm. They need to have cups of tea. It's things like mm. that, which, you know, they're not glamorous. It's not like olive oil. I don't think the olive oil price... It's interesting what you say about the older generation, though. Yeah. Um, I always go back to um, the lockdown when the old man was in a care home for nine months. And I literally, mm. after about... I don't know, three weeks, they'd done a glass thing so you could see him. And I said, how are you doing? And he went, absolutely grand. We did this for six years in the Second World War. I'm getting three hot meals a day. I'm having an absolute yeah. wonderful time. And what I'm saying is all those things that we now go, oh, and, and were normal and commonplace, have we? I'm not against the obvious difficulties that people are having. Have we become soft? Have we become entitled? What? Have we become expectant of too much, do you think? Just things like putting on an extra jumper when it's yep. chilly at home. Yep. You know, I do think... I see young young folk where I live... <laughs> young folk? ...drifting around in a T-shirt and flip-flops, you know, in December, and you think, well, they've probably got the central heating blaring it's away at home. Yeah. You know, learn that when it gets chillier, you do put on bed socks and a jumper or whatever, I mean... Yeah. I would never wear anything so unglamorous in bed. Though, isn't it? it is. I think, and it's it's good. I, I think it's really sad if people are doing this because of financial reasons. But if they're doing it for eco reasons, you know, popping on a jumper, yeah, not, wa using not wasting bags. is good. You can save money, and you're also helping the environment by not filling up landfill by not wasting so many exactly. so much stuff. I mean, it, it, it's kind of a win-win thing anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There you are. If you need to use a tea bag twice, you're doing something for the community or the environment. That's great news, isn't it? Uh, Emma, let's talk about Japanese cherry blossoms. Yeah. What? This is a lovely, just, yeah, just an uplifting gorgeous. story for once, because everything is so grim in this country. Japanese cherry blossom in Gloucester. It has to be Japanese, though. It's see, blossomed it? at the Batsford Arboretum. It's flowered two weeks earlier than normal, and it's so beautiful. I don't know if we've got pictures of it, but it's beautiful. And it's a, the, the head gardener is saying it's a magical time for spring flowering trees and shrubs. Yeah. I think they're called the Japanese village cherries. So I've cool. seen so much cherry blossom there where we live. It just it lifts really the mood, lifts doesn't the it? Spirit. But yeah. to try and be gone a in a bit couple of, of weeks. gloom and doom, this is because we've got warmer weather and there is climate change to blame for oh. it, James. Yeah, I mean, it's, Sorry. the weather is... Oh. There's an issue we, we talked about, um, olive oil earlier. I mean, there's an issue with prices of chocolate is going to be going up soon because, because uh, cocoa 
Um, the price of that's going to be going up, and it's to do with weather, extreme weather. Here we've we've had the wettest February on record. We've just had uh, is is the first two weeks of of this month. I think it's been record amounts of rain, and it seems you know it seems kind of doesn't really affect us, but it does affect farmers and people who grow the food, which affects the prices. Yeah. Well, sorry, it was a, it was a positive story. Yeah, with no, you brought a downer on all of it. You've got a double so, use of tea bag, but there's tell you what, in Gloucester. There's no downer right. in the next story, James. Yeah. Talk to us about. British national treasure, Luke Littler. Well done, you, because it says Kittler there. It says Kittler. And, and am I right? And they would never have known if you hadn't said it. Well, I think we've a lot to deal with. There's no <laughs> cherry blossom in this place. We've got 30 studio. seconds, I'm James. Stressed. So, Luke Littler's, uh, he's appeared on the Forbes uh, 30 under 30 list, list, which is, I mean, the list itself, sometimes some of these people are self nominated. Is this so under 30? A... I'm, I'm going to get. Into... What is this under 30? What? Million? You don't quid? have to look under 30 to get on it. So but is it age right. or is it uh, weight? What he's is, only, what is he's it? only he's, 16. I mean, he's done okay. well. He's done well for himself. He's he did, amazing. Uh, he, he's done well for himself. He, he, unlike probably a few of the people on there who've <laughs> nominated themselves, he actually, I think, deserves to be on there. Absolutely. Nation's sweetheart. And he's bringing out a gym kit. Champion too. breakfast eater. Yeah. <laughs> what a wow. lad. But I have to tell you something. Dark is apparently now sexy and far more popular voice has brought a whole new audience he's, to he's darts. He's completely changed the game. Uh, so good. Are on you fair, a darts fan? Yes, I've got a darts board at home. Yeah. yeah, with your face on it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this Bullseye. morning, Emma Wolf and James Bloodworth. I need to go to a break and do some... I need to double... What's it, you need to go bag. to the toilet. No, I need to put Bless my bag in twice. You. Well, you at home, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions all morning. In fact, we're going to be doing a debate later on in the show, oh, this just is good. after the break, actually. Cat calling. After a council in Nottinghamshire is proposing to use legal powers to ban cat calling in its area. But is cat calling harassment or a bit of harmless fun, some people allege? Uh, Ruth says, really, they can't enforce real crimes but want to do this nonsense? Uh, Paul, got to love these useless councils and politicians. They take, take, take and give little or nothing back. Peter says 50-year-old men catcalling schoolgirls is definitely out of order. There's two very different arguments in these following two messages which sum up entirely why we're doing the debate. Doreen says personally I don't mind a bit of harmless flirting. It's about getting it's about reading body language, but I totally understand and accept why not everyone enjoys these kinds of interactions. And strangely, Kevin. Well, we're going to be debate. Oh, sorry, Kevin says... No, read Kevin, because it's interesting. I believe any man who has a daughter knows what it feels like when your little girl is surrounded by a group of males catcalling her. Mm. I don't care about their fun because it's totally intolerable to me. It's interesting if you've got a daughter. That's a really interesting point. I agree with Kevin. Your thoughts. Yes, and it shouldn't be the fact that you've got a daughter that you would even accept that that was not on. Well, still to come on Talk Today, a council, as I've said, in Nottinghamshire is proposing to use legal powers to ban catcalling in its area. We're going to be debating all about that, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. After the break, this is Talk Today. It is 8.43. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back. You were talked today. It's just gone called tonight. Kevin Alex from 9.30 and Julia Hartley Brewer from 10. Now, Ashfield District Council, which is actually in the constituency that Lee Anderson, who quit the Tories and went to reform, is planning to use legal powers to make catcalling a criminal offence under an existing public space protection order. Under the new PSPO, people will be liable for fines for rude or unwelcome comments. Now, we've been to Ashfield to find out what they think. There's been times where I've been walking to my partner's house, this were a few years ago, and I'd be wearing the most comfiest clothes in the world, jogs and a hoodie, and there'd be mainly people, men in vans, that it, as I'm walking past would shout, whistle, say, oh, hey up sexy and stuff like that. It's a bit uncomfortable. If it was offensive behaviour and, and some people didn't like it, that's fine. But if they were just ordinary liberal people like me, then it would be OK. But where do you draw the line? I think the idea is stupid, really. Um, serious catcalling in an offensive way is something else. Um, but if it's in a harmless manner, I don't see the problem. Well, obviously, the comments aren't necessary. However, I just think councils need to prioritise and put themselves in the shoes of what they need to look at, like the potholes, the safety, rather than messing about with people having banter, having freedom of speech. So should we make catcalling a criminal offence? Well, joining us now to debate this is the news movement's Rebecca Hudson. Editor. Thank you. Who believes that this behaviour can become a gateway to more dangerous offences? Meanwhile, the former deputy leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane Sutton, both called Rebecca, thinks that some women find catcalling flattering and that the day we ban this behaviour is the day we need to worry. Uh, let's start with you. Um, if we, I'm going to call Rebecca Hudson-Bex, because I know I'm going to call Rebecca Jane Sutton, Rebecca. Rebecca, um... People will sit, certainly these two, and I get it, right, and they'll go, this is abhorrent, this is wrong. How do you come on national television and, and say, actually, it's all right? How do you justify that, then? Well, because I think the difference is, is if we think it's OK or if we think we should criminalise it and take sanctions against it. I don't like it. It's absolutely not something that I enjoy. However, I think that we can't criminalise it because where do we draw a line on this? And we are in a state right now where we are letting people free from jails because our prisons are so full. And now we want to talk about doing something so, you know, almost meaningless. And obviously I'm looking forward to hearing the other Rebecca because obviously she has a stance that um, this can lead to further offending behaviour. But I would like to see one person who says, yes, I started out catcalling and then I became a rapist. You know, uh, that doesn't happen. There are plenty it's not of nice, but we can't criminalise it. There are Plenty. Sorry? There are plenty of instances of that, but I'm going to bring in Becca Hudson to just uh, give her point of view on this topic. Yes, thank you very much. Well, to address that initial point, we know that non-consensual, non-contact sexual offences, you can call it banter, you can call it being sexually aggressive in the street, literally does lead to some of the most heinous crimes against women that we have seen. You know, we saw, for example, the murder of Zara Alina tragically in London a few years ago 
Georgia McSweeney was going from shop to shop, shouting abuse at women before he conducted that murder. So actually, men who think that they have the opportunity and the right to own the public space and make women feel unsafe and make them feel like they are the butt of quote unquote banter is really, really dangerous. But that obviously is the most extreme example. And that's not to suggest that all men or all men that do this are, um, you know, potential kind of serial offenders against women. But I think this contributes to this whole feeling that the outside world is, a, is the man's world. And that you're, if you're a woman in it, you have to suck up what they want to call banter. If they want to shout something at you, if they want to make a comment about what you're wearing, how you look, how you're appealing, that that's just something that we've got to live with. And I agree with Rebecca, it's pretty ridiculous. We've got to this point that we have to potentially legalize this. But women have been saying this for decades. It's not funny, it's not flattering, it's not flirting, it's not a compliment, so stop doing it. And if we now need to bring in legislation to stop men doing it, maybe that's maybe that's that's where we've got to it. That's a really sad indictment of the conversation between men and women. But another Rebecca? Is enough. And those Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a very sad situation, but where do we draw like You're saying that obviously he went from shop to shop calling abuse. That's a little bit of a different situation. Cat calling is often a wolf whistle. And that's what I mean by show me one person that says that I started wolf whistling as people and then became a racist. Forgive me. I don't know any cases. A so if there are any, racist, please yeah? do inform me. Can I just say a rapist, not Sorry, a racist? racist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't think there's many people um, who would admit to it, and that, that is probably the key thing there. there but, go. Rebecca Jane, um, you know, we've spoken about this potentially being a gateway, etc., which is very serious, um, but in and of itself, we're not talking about somebody flirting in the street here, are we? We are talking about unwanted, non-consensual comments that are essentially done to intimidate women or make women feel objectified. You'd surely be supportive of that, of legislating against that? Rebecca Jane. No, no? because we've got such bigger issues. You absolutely, no, absolutely not. Do you really think that taxpayer money is best spent on somebody who's wolf whistled at a person in the street? Well, they would be fine, because so I they would end up paying money for antisocial behaviour. They would be fine, so they would end up paying for it. Exactly. And you know what? Antisocial behaviour is not being dealt with. Burglaries are not being turned up to. People are in a lot of difficult financial crimes that have, they've been a victim of and they're not getting solved. So I tell you what, before you want to start on the person who's doing a wolf whistle in the street, sort out everything else first. What would you say to a guest, uh, sorry, a viewer who uh, texted us earlier in the show to say that he, his daughter and her friends had been catcalled by men in their 50s and he felt as though everything and anything should be done in order to prosecute and prevent that from happening. What would you say to him? Yeah, I think it's absolutely disgusting and I completely agree. I started out this by saying that I don't like it either. I find it embarrassing, I find it demoralising, but the difference is I don't think we should be getting the police involved and trying to legislate this. Do you know what? Go and give him a peace of mind. Tell him what you think of him. But don't start calling the police because of it. I'm sorry, but I just think that there's far bigger issues that we need to be dealing can I, with. Uh, can I jump in, although I'm not a lady? Can I just give you, Bex, can I give you um, two examples of the same argument? Fiona, I remember my colleague I used to work with on a few occasions. I've seen her come to work with a massive great grin on her face saying, and I quote, they've just been wolfing me and it's made me feel really good this morning. Bianca, flip it completely, it is harassment. I've been through this as a woman. Imagine a group of men all leering over at you and then having the nerve to say something because he and his group think it's cool. It doesn't feel nice and it's disgusting. Both views, Bex. Yeah, totally both views. I think if some people see it as a compliment, there are other ways to get compliments. But if that behaviour is making people feel like your second co uh, uh, commentator or the first lady that you voxed um, in Ashfield, making women feel unsafe, degraded and objectified, that it's worth dealing with. There are so many ways to compliment women in a consensual and polite manner. You don't need to leer. What do you say to Rebecca Jane who says, oh, come on, this is ludicrous. Not everybody. And by the way, I, I mean, I'm sat on the fence here for one obvious reason. I've got daughters and I, and I agree with that man. However, is this symptomatic of a society that won't deal, as she says, with burglary and won't deal with problems, but is going to go and find somebody who goes, oi, darling, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence, you know I am, but answer that question that she made, because I think it's relevant. 
Well, we're not talking about people going to prison, are we? We're talking about people getting a hundred quid fine, which is a real sting in the wallet. So I think a great way to teach someone a lesson, you make an unwanted comment, you leer at someone, she complains, you're marched to a cash point. How embarrassing for you, you're a hundred quid worse off and you've probably learned a lesson. And maybe you then intervene with your mates and say, actually, don't, don't do that. Like it, it's not worth it. And you, maybe you've had one minute to think about how you've made that woman feel. And I think that's brilliant. And this isn't about decriminalizing burglary or letting them get away with it. It's about dealing with a really core issue that we have in society here, where women are made to feel unsafe by men all the time, and it's sickening. Uh, Rebecca Jane, it's not men that are self-reporting themselves to the council here. It would be the person, the victim, who's on the receiving end. Therefore, isn't there an argument to say that whoever is doing this wolf whistling or catcalling and thinks that it's welcome and thinks that it's flirty, better actually be sure that they're doing that because it's not on how they, what they uh, intend to do, it's how it's received by the individual. And if they better be pretty certain if that kind of comment is gonna be actually welcomed. Right, fair point. However, that is the most unbelievably difficult thing that you're ever going to so have don't do it. to try and legit hang on a second. I've not finished. So that's the most difficult thing you're going to have to legislate because what's going to happen is you're going to get an abuse of the process. You've missed the point in all of this of how many rapes are not convicted. And now you think that somebody's going to go and report it to the police and they're automatically going to be believed. Uh, what ladies, about the people that have got a grudge to grind? I, 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 I could carry on doing this all day to everybody who's called Rebecca. I'm just going to finish with Stephen. I was wolf whistled a little while ago by a young woman. I'm a 61-year-old man. I was actually flattered and it made me chuckle. Whether it was serious or not, it is just a bit of fun and it did my self-esteem no harm. I can tell you people should stop worrying. I can tell you, Stephen, that other people would worry. We can carry this debate on whether it leads to worse behaviour, whether it's a, a sign of a, a bigger problem, I don't exactly. know. But anybody called Rebecca, thank you for coming and how on. how threatened would a 61-year-old man be of a young woman? Well, only he can say that. Can't I'm he? not 61. I need to go to the loo. Can you crack on? Yes, please. Thank two you. Rebecca's, two yes, very, please. very strong opinions. Rebecca Hudson and Rebecca Jane Sutton, thank you both for joining us. Well, still to come, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Treating has branded NHS treatment of kids questioning their gender as scandalous. We're discussing that and finding out what else he had to say next. Do keep getting in touch with your news and your opinions. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722, almost nine. We're coming back. Please join us or we'll be on our own. ta -ra. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning, it's 9 o'clock on Thursday, the 11th of April. It absolutely is. You would talk today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. These are Thursday morning's top stories. Developments overnight in Bradford as 25-year-old Habiba Masoom is charged with murdering a mother who was stabbed while she pushed her baby in a pram. Uh, a trans treatment row ignites inside the Labour Party after the Shadow Health Secretary Wes uh, Streeting through his support last night behind that four-year cast review. And forget the croissant, the cronut, or the cookie. This morning, it's all about the cookie. That's crookie to you and me, Jeremy. Well, we'll go live to a baker causing a culinary sensation. And warm and sunny in April. What a time to be alive. I'll have the details in the forecast at the end of the programme. Cheers, Naz. Well, now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The man police arrested over the fatal stabbing of a mum in Bradford while she was walking her baby in a pram has been charged with murder. Habiba Masoom, who's 25, is due to appear at Bradford Magistrates Court this morning. He's also charged with possession of a knife. Masoom is accused of stabbing Kalsuma Akta, who was 27, in broad daylight on Saturday. She died later in hospital. The victim's family described her as polite and humble and someone who made the people around her laugh. We'll be live in Bradford in a moment. A woman who died following a stabbing in London has been named as detectives continue to appeal for information. The body of 27-year-old Kamonan Thiam Fanit was found on Monday in Westminster after her friends contacted police concerned about her welfare. She was known to friends as Angela and neighbours reportedly heard two high-pitched screams hours before her body was found. The U.S. president has vowed support for Israel amid threats by Iran to retaliate for this month's deadly strike on its consulate in Syria. Joe Biden said the U.S.'s commitment to Israel is ironclad and that it will do all it can to protect Israel's security. Here, and nearly half of NHS staff are looking for a new job outside of the service. Figures released today found 47% of people have spent time looking at job adverts to leave the NHS, while around a third had actively inquired about it. Well, former NHS Trust Chair Roy Lilly has told Talk Today that he's not surprised. We're seeing a lot of youngsters now who once went into nursing because they sort of wanted a, a job for life. It was a career. Now they're saying, you know what, I want a job and a life. And a lot of them are leaving the NHS. And a once-a-day pill to treat migraines has been given the green light on the NHS in England, which could help relieve symptoms in more than 170,000 people. The drug will be an option for frequent sufferers who've tried at least three other treatments without success. But there are all calls this morning for the life-changing pill to be made more accessible on the NHS as quickly as possible. You're up to date with the headlines. I'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Thanks, Em. We start this morning and this hour in Bradford, where a 25-year-old man has been charged over the murder of a mother who was stabbed to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. Well, Habiba Masoom from Burnley will appear in court later after he was arrested during a four-day manhunt following the killing of 27-year-old Kulsuma actor on Saturday. Our correspondent Nick Ellaby joins us live from Bradford with the very latest. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Nicola, as well. Bradford Magistrates Court about to open here and, and Habiba Masoom, as you've mentioned, 25 years old, known resident of Burnley, has been charged with murder 
and also possession of a bladed article. He'll appear here at the court later this morning. It follows the killing of 27-year-old mother, Kulsuma Akta, who was stabbed to death in broad daylight here in the centre of Bradford on Saturday afternoon. It happened just a mile to the north of here, the northwest edge of the centre of the city, at uh, the corner of Westgate with Druton Road. And it, it, there are, she was pushing her baby in a pram, and a shocking detail of this already shocking case. And it, it's a case that people around here are talking about a lot and, and have their eyes on. Um, there is footage of police caring for the baby after the killing. Uh, unfortunately, Miss Actor died in hospital of her injuries. Paramedics weren't able to save her. Habib Masum, who was arrested on Tuesday morning, 150 miles to the south of here in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, that's after a four-day manhunt. The police raided properties in Burnley, in Oldham, and also in Chester. And they've also arrested and at the moment holding four other men from the West Midlands area. They're being questioned on suspicion of aiding an offender and, and also on drugs charges as well. And there's a fifth man who was arrested in connection with this case uh, from Chester, but he's now been, been bailed. The police, West Yorkshire Police, uh, have referred themselves to the police watchdog over this incident, the IOPC, that's the Independent Office for Police Conduct, because they had contact with the victim, Miss Actor, before she was killed on Saturday. Now, Miss Actor's cousin has described her as loving, caring, humble, and also having the gift of being able to make people laugh. It's reported her mother, living in Bangladesh, has been constantly crying since she heard the news. But that headline again, Habiba Masum, 25 years old, known to be a resident of Burnley, will appear here at Bradford Magistrates Court later this morning, charged with murder and possession of a bladed article. Well, thank you so much, Nick Ellaby in Bradford there. Very, very sad Thanks, case Nick. indeed. Well, to politics now, and where Streeting has branded NHS treatment of kids questioning their gender as scandalous. Now, speaking to Harry Cole, last night on Nevermind the Ballots, the Shadow Health Secretary was asked whether his position on trans issues had changed as his party battles with their definition of a man and a woman. Here is what Streeting had to say last night. Take a listen, take a watch. They ran a campaign saying trans women are trans, trans women are women. Get over it. Do you agree with that? Mm, uh, no, it's to the extent that, that, and I say this with some self-criticism and reflection. If you'd asked me a few years ago uh, on this topic, I would have said trans men are men, trans women are women. Some people are trans. Get over it. Let's move on. This is this is all blown out of proportion. And now I sort of it's... sit and reflect and think actually. There are lots of complexities Isn't that and challenges the problem, though, leading debate. figures like yourself, and I'm not just singling you out, but leading figures like yourself were saying, get over it, no, when people, were trying, to, like, when people right. were trying to raise the facts. So you regret... I think you regret. I absolutely take the criticism on the chin. Well, joining us to discuss this is The Sun's columnist, Trevor Kavanagh. Trevor, good morning. What good did morning. you make of that interview with Harry Cole? Well, I think Harry's done the job. I think he's actually prized out of the Labour health spokesman and hopefully the whole of the Labour Party the admission that they've got it terribly wrong. What they haven't said is how many children, young people have been, had their lives ruined by the sort of treatment and uh, medical attention and indeed surgery mm. that has destroyed some of their lives. Um, the interesting thing for me is, um, and, and I said this yesterday, <coughs> Trevor, and you've got so much experience you'll be able to answer this. For me, the big issue, we talked about it all week, is, is, is actually that any time you try and have a, a trans debate, for want of a better thing, you get accused of all sorts of things. There's certain things in this country you can't talk about. I think the very fact this woman took four years and has highlighted the thing about children is the most important thing. And whether Labour is jump, jumping in line or whether the Tories should have done more after 14 years, the fact of the matter is, to young kids who don't know their minds, going through surgery, giving puberty blockers, for me, the whole thing centres on Trevor. I've been saying it for 48 hours. It shouldn't be an instantaneous decision. It should be done in the right way with counselling and the involvement of both parents and all sorts of people. And, and actually, we are all as a society responsible. We need to say, yes, this can happen, but we need to make safeguards right and proper, don't we? Well, I think that 99.9%, .9 to quote uh, Keir Starmer's figures, would agree with your, every word you say there. And if people had listened to the overwhelming majority of people in this country with common sense, this would never have happened. Yeah, great. But this is sort of mass hysteria that comes not just with uh, vulnerable adolescents who are going through difficult times. Mm. 
<coughs> is a sort of mass hysteria which is uh, engulfing us all in the culture wars and not just on trans, which is the most difficult one of all. There's the problem of uh, the climate change, net zero, and all of the problems with uh, Islamophobia. Uh, this is why we have the hate crime in Scotland, almost entirely because of the trans issue. Um, it's... We did that earlier. 7,000, wasn't it, Nick? 7,000 hate crimes, 7,800, have been reported in the last seven days to the Scottish police, you know. Uh, Hamza used this idea of, of, of hate crimes, and they're only following up on 200. Mm. Not on the streets dealing with burglaries and people being attacked, like that terribly poor woman in Bradford. All sorts of stuff. What, what I'm saying is, when we talk about culture wars, we talk about woke, we talk about this, we need to be able to have these debates, don't we, Trev, without feeling frightened. I mean, I'm old enough to remember you couldn't mention immigration 10 years ago because you were called racist. But we need to have these discussions. But we talk about trans issues every day on this channel. We talk about immigration every day. No, we you do, because this channel does it. You can't possibly say that we can't talk about it. It's just the ways in which it's spoken about mm. and the criticism that it receives and where I think criticism is completely valid and needed, but where that goes from being critical to harassing somebody for their views. The th big problem here is that you cannot say anything, as you just described, until someone else stands up with authority, like uh, Dr Miriam Cass or J.K. Rowling, and actually speaks on behalf of the great majority of this country. And there's, therefore, there's a voice that we can echo and report, and it has traction, but ordinary people are ignored and swept aside on so many issues today which are dividing this country in a way which I think is uh, causing... Um, Serious problems to society, which may be permanent unless there's. Why are we legally speaking? Sorry, on, sorry legally <coughs> speaking, it is true to say that somebody who has legally transitioned is legally defined as um, whatever sex they've transitioned to. So it is already within law. It's within law, but it's not. But it, you cannot simply change biological sex, and that is it. Full stop. If yeah. you were born a male, you remain a, a male, even if you decide to identify as a female. Mm. That is common sense. And it's biological sense, it's scientific sense, and you cannot overturn scientific rules. Can I, can I bring it to the political side? I mean, one of the things... We started this at 6 o'clock this morning. Um, we criticise our politicians a lot, Trev, and we say, oh, they don't listen. Is Wes Streeting, uh, taking the opposite view a minute, is he actually acknowledging that opinions change? Is he listening to people and saying, yeah, I got it wrong? Should we criticise him for that? Should we say, you're just doing what all politicians do, you're trying to curry favour and get a job, you're trying to get into government? Or should we say, actually, he's doing what politicians fail to do so often, which is listen to the British people? Yes, I think West Streeting is a breath of fresh air, yeah, in the Labour too. Party in particular, which seems to tie itself in knots with all of the uh, culture wars and the verities and the things you can say I think he's a future say. Prime Minister, Trevor. I think he sees himself as a future Prime Minister and I think he's staking out the ground very, very carefully for that because he is the only person in the Labour Party at the moment who's actually saying what is otherwise unsayable. It's interesting, interesting though, because he, he did say that. He didn't actually nail his colours to the mast and, and do a definition. I don't think we necessarily need that from him. He's admitted, though, that it is a very nuanced issue was we were just discussing there when we talk when you were talking about woman you were thinking about the biological uh, version of, of the definition whereas i was thinking about the legal definition now of course both of those things can be true and contrast at the same time and yet we're not hurling insults or harassing no. each other for having done that the discussion. but exactly but at the center of this is a vulnerable group is a group of people who have had difficulty with their self-identification, their identification, who they are as a person. And it's been used so much, isn't it, by both sides as this political football, whereas actually, do you think we should be approaching this issue with far more compassion? Well, I think that they deserve compassion and I think they're a vulnerable group. Yeah. They, sh they should not be transforming society to cope with their vulnerability. Right. Um, we should not all be running around assuming that uh, you can change biological sex simply because of a vulnerable group who needs sympathy. Uh, that applies to an awful lot of other people in, in society. You cannot change society to adapt to one small mm. vocal group. Well, Trevor, speaking of vulnerable groups... Now, this is Trevor. I, you don't know we're going to ambush you this, but I expect a <laughs> massive smile on your face. A bloke fed up with negativity over his name has set up a support group... <laughs> for people called Trevor. Have you seen this in The Sun, mate? This. Trevor Cunningham, 66, says he wants to stop the maligned moniker being leaked to geeks and nitwits. <laughs> That's outrageous, man, in your paper. I plead guilty to nitwit, but not <laughs> to geek 
I thought if I could get Trevors from all over the world to offer their services for free to other Trevors, people would then associate the name with kindness. The once popular title shared by the likes of Trevor Brooking, broadcaster Trevor MacDonald, and the legend that is Trevor Kavanagh, the son, <laughs> fell out of favour in the 1970s. I, I didn't know this. I never, I never realised I was part of a vulnerable group, and therefore <laughs> I need to change the law. Ian oh. Jury's 1977 song, Clever Trevor, apparently... I think this is outrageous. It's a classy name, Trevor, isn't it? Well, in 2020, only 11 babies were given that name. But these names come back in fashion, don't they? Listen, Jeremy's the worst name you could call a child in the history of the world. But Jeremy Look Bear and the Sugar Puck are ridiculous. So yeah, I'd I rather sympathise with Trevor. Really. Most of us don't like our first name. Do you not like the name, Trevor? I want to... I, I, my middle name is Michael, which is what my father wanted to christen me. My mother fancied Trevor Howard, who was a famous actor at the time, <laughs> so I ended up... I was lumbered with the name Trevor. I wonder why I was called Jeremy. <laughs> My mother ate sugar puffs or something. <laughs> Listen, Trevor Kavanagh, you're a legend. Thank you very much indeed Thank for coming. Thank you so very much, Trevor Kavanagh. Very interested to get your angry, my friend. From, uh, for coming into the studio. We like his name. Well, we do. Well, still to come. Oh, no. Move over croissants, donuts, and all other sweet treats because now it's all about the crookie. We'll meet a baker to ask what they are and try some ourselves next. We're meeting a baker? We're meeting a cookie. There's a, a link crookie. there. Uh, this is Talk Today, nearly. 9.15. Thank you, Trev. See you in a bit. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treacle. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. Uh, it's, it's almost 20 past nine. Kevin and Alex are here at 9.30, Julia from 10. Now, move over cookies and cronuts. What's a cronut? That's a croissant mixed with a donut. Crazy. It's all about the cookie. Apparently, the new sweet treat combining a Parisian croissant 
with an American style cookie dough has been making culinary waves on social media. I hate how good that was. Well, joining us mm -hmm. this morning is oh. baker and cookie enthusiast Leanne oh. Mayo. Leanne, good morning. Why? Can you tell us, please? These smell absolutely delicious. I'm eating now. What inspired you to start making these? Um, so I saw the trend on TikTok. Um, obviously, it started in Paris. Oh my the God! Amazing accent. Um, and uh, I decided I would branch out and try them. So we started doing them a few weeks ago and they were really popular. So um, what we've got is Nutella, Biscoff, milk chocolate, mm. apple crumble, and I'm just about to take out of the oven um, Bakewell. Um, mm. What I haven't seen is other people doing different flavors. So I wanted to... Uh, I don't want to talk to you. I'm just really eating. These are incredible. These are absolutely <laughs> delicious, Leanne. Oh so you say you got your inspiration. I hope you've got them warmed up. They, they. We do, yeah. We warmed them up. Thank you for sending them over. Um, oh, you said you got your inspiration okay. from TikTok. Is that the case for other items in the bakery? I've noticed on TikTok over the past few months, loads of kind of fusion desserts, like we say the krona, etc. What, um, what inspired you to mix these two things together, though? Why I'm do you think talking. they work so well? This is wonderful. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the trends do start on TikTok. Um, it just it, it just takes one video to blow up, and then you know you you end up with something like this, which is obviously like a Franken dessert, um, really a Franken dessert. delicious. I love that. And what does that wouldn't mean? necessarily. What is a yeah. Franken dessert? So it's a mixture of two different things, I suppose, so, like Frankenstein. Yeah, a mixture of two desserts to make it extra indulgent. Are they, um, I, I don't know whether your baker is on the high street. There's more cars going past your window, love. But, do, I mean, is this, is this business taking off for you? Is it, do you work in a bakery or do you make it from home and send it out? How do you do it? Um, I actually... I'm on my driveway right now, which is where my bakery is. Um, so I sell on my driveway on no Saturdays way. and... Uh, yeah, it seems to be pretty popular. You sell people on your like driveway? It, come. We've got so much amazing support. Yeah, yeah, we're on my driveway. It's my kitchen behind me. Why don't you get a um, shop, or have yeah, I missed the point? It works. <laughs> I have three kids, so this just works for us right now. Here's the thing. Uh, maybe in the future. It. When I get home, my wife's going to say, oh, that looked great. So I'm eating a... Look at that, lovely. I'm eating a croissant full of chocolate and cookies and... Not the healthiest, though, is it, to be fair? <laughs> and I'm not being rude, Leanne, but you're not going to be wanting to eat this stuff all the time because <laughs> you'll end up looking like me. I don't think you want to eat it all the time. Maybe just once a week on Saturdays. Mm. Um, it's Thursday, we do, mate. You know, occasionally we have people come down and ask for no-sugar snacks and I have to tell them you're at a cookie stall. <laughs> it's not the right environment. Aren't to people be boring? For no, no sugar snacks. Go away and <laughs> Leanne, eat a root vegetable. What, yeah. what do you think the next yes. Franken dessert is going to be? What's the next fusion that you're going to make at your cookie oh, stall? Oh, my goodness. I have no idea. I've seen some people making uh, cookies with hot cross buns. People are now just putting cookies in every baked item. I'm going to set your challenge. Um, I'm going to set I'm your not, challenge. I'm not the biggest fan of hot cross buns. I'm going to set your yeah. challenge. I don't know how this works. We'll see, You're going to we'll laugh see. at me. The greatest <laughs> dessert ever costs 99p from Iceland. It's called Arctic Roll. Do you know what Arctic Roll is? Ice cream with, with um, I Swiss love an roll. Arctic roll. Right, see if you can make, and yeah. I will promote this anywhere, see if you can make, how would you call that? <laughs> a Arctic bowl. I don't know what you call it. I mean, I'm a just croissant. Saying, an arthritic Arctic <laughs> roll or something. See, I, I don't laugh. Yeah, I mean, you could do the, instead of cake on the outside, you could do cookie, right? Yeah. And then have the ice cream in the middle. So it's There we go. Listen, we might yeah, need a new job. Work. Listen, a new <laughs> business idea is great. See if you can make an Arctic roll one. Leanne, Ma Leanne Mail, is it male? Do you know how you okay. make an Arctic? Do you know how you make a nail? Yes. No. Push it down a hill. <laughs> Sorry. I do apologise, <laughs> Leanne. I think finally, after six months, she, just <laughs> you crack on eating, love. That'll Thank be fine. You. Brilliant for you coming on. Arctic <laughs> Roll Cookie Crumble. That's the company. It's fantastic. Uh, standing by, by the way, are Kev and Alex. They'll have a happy fun hour. I'm going to take this next door and give it to them and see if he can get his chops around that. Uh, Thank you, you there to Leanne Stop. Mayo from Cookie Crumble. We've done London. that. Well, that's all from here. Uh, We're not here, here tomorrow. Today. No, David Bull and Rosie it's Wright. not David Bull at all. It's David Haig, a human rights lawyer, pretending <laughs> to be David Bull. Well, David Bull and Rosie Wright will be here from 6am tomorrow. Kev and Alex are up next. But first, here is the weather with Naz. We're going to have a... What is it? A crookie? A lot of chocolate. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello, it's finally looking warm and bright across much of the UK for this afternoon. Not everywhere, though, along southern areas of England, mainly around the south coast, it will be murky, cloudy, and there will be some patchy light rain and drizzle. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, largely dry as well, and above average temperatures. We could locally see highs of 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, this most likely around the East Midlands towards East Anglia. But as I said, everywhere seeing above average temperatures. Overnight then, and we start to see rain spreading across Ireland, Northern Ireland, the north and west of England, and Wales and over Scotland as well. It will turn a bit blustery across these parts, but the winds are coming from a southwesterly direction, a mild airflow, so it remains mild overnight everywhere with temperatures in double figures once again. And then for tomorrow, it's more of a northwest southeast divide, and it's the north and west seeing the unsettled conditions with showery rain at times across Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and parts of northern England at first, particularly to the northwest. But the rest of England and Wales seeing some good spells of sunshine, and there will be mainly dry conditions there. Warm again with the highest temperature of the year so far possible in the southeast at up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Mate, might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know uh, it's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say 